Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the 10th session of the Waterloo sessions of the RQI 2021 online, or RQI online 2021. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, our first invited speaker. It's gonna be uh, Professor Achim Kemp from the University of Waterloo. Achim, you can share screen anytime you want. Can you see my screen? I can, perfect. So anyway, so it's 30 minutes. Uh, I'll give you a five minute warning. Achim, the floor is yours whenever you want. Thank you very much, Elio. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, okay, so I will talk today about um, an approach to quantum gravity where the notion of distance is replaced by the notion of correlation. Um, let's see, right. Now, why is quantum gravity hard? There are of course many reasons, but I'd like to point out one, one possible reason why it is so hard. See, when Einstein introduced general relativity, the mathematical framework of it, he also provided a map to experiments, a one-to-one -one map using rods and clocks as uh, the main concept to translate the math into the physics. And from those rods and clocks, we then obtain coordinate systems and so on. Now, rods and clocks are funny things if you think about it. On one hand, they are not canonical. They are not covariant. They are human-made. They don't occur naturally in nature. In fact, there are no rod-like or clock-like things at subatomic scales. And let's compare space and time. Space and time are very similar in their mathematical description. They only differ by a minus sign or a factor of i. But now let's compare the tools that we use to measure them, rods and clocks. They seem to be rather different. They seem to be more different than just differing by a minus sign or a factor of i. Now, with the rods and clocks, we build coordinate systems. And coordinate systems have some funny features too. Coordinate systems are, for example, completely ignorant of any drama on the light cone. Two points can be arbitrarily close in a coordinate system, and yet one of them is inside the light cone and one of them is outside the light cone, and that can make all the difference in regards to causality, whether something is um, responsible for something or not. And indeed, in order to do quantum gravity, we require to mod out by all of this nonsense. We don't want in quantum gravity to, to have to quantize coordinate systems. We want to mod that out. I will come back to that later. Um, um, what I mean is that when we quantize gravity, we want to pass integrate over geometries. We do not want to pass integrate over choices of coordinate systems because geometries are physics. Coordinate systems are human-made. It would be inappropriate to quantize a human choice, but it can be very hard to separate the physical degrees of freedom of geometry from human degrees of freedom of choices of coordinates once we do introduce coordinate systems. Therefore, um, I consider the goal here today to express all degrees of freedom um, the geometric degrees of freedom, as well as the metric degrees of freedom, basis independently, independent of uh, choices of coordinate systems, and in fact, independent of, uh, in fact, I want to go beyond using in principle rods and clocks to measure space time distances. Maybe we can do something better than that. So let's give it a try. First question, how can we upgrade from rods and clocks? Well, there may be multiple ways to do so. I would like to point out one of them. There is in nature a canonical tool to determine space-time distances. And that tool is the vacuum fluctuations of quantum fields. These quantum fluctuations are correlated. The quantum fluctuations at one location in space-time are correlated to the quantum fluctuations at another location in space-time. And they are the stronger correlated, the closer the two regions of space-time are. And if 
you look at very far apart regions in space time, then these quantum fluctuations at the two locations are very weakly or essentially not correlated anymore. So the strength of the correlation of vacuum fluctuations is a measure of space-time distance directly. And in principle, we can measure quantum fluctuations of the vacuum. It's not something we routinely measure, but for example, in quantum optics, there are quantum homotone detectors with which you can measure quantum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. In principle, you can measure that at two locations, and the stronger the correlations are, the closer the two locations are. And you never need to invoke anything like a rod or a clock to measure the distance if you do it this way. Now, how is it expressed mathematically? Well, let's consider the two-point correlator such as a two-point correlator such as the, uh, the propagator, <clears throat> G2. Um, G2 is the larger, the closer the two events X and Y are, expressing that the more the quantum fluctuations of the vacuum are correlated. So G2 of X and Y, the propagator, is a measure of space-time distance. At tree level, it's of course just the Feynman propagator. Now, if indeed space-time distances can be expressed in terms of correlation strength, well, then it ought to be possible to build general relativity on it. Can we do that? Can we replace the notion of metric by the notion of correlation? And that's, in a simple way, this is actually possible. Um, together with um, the students Siavash Sambegi and Mestri Saravani, um, we published this result here. Namely, um, the equation here shows that the metric on the left-hand side is expressible in terms of the uh, two-point function, two-point correlator, in terms of the propagator um, in, in this way. You just differentiate the propagator, take the coincidence limit, and then multiply with some prefactors that have to do with the dimension, capital D, of the space-time, and you get the metric. Uh, notice that if D is equal to two, then that formula doesn't work. So for two-dimensional space-times, there's a different formula that involves a logarithm. Anyway, why does such a thing work? Why can we get the metric from uh, the propagator? Well, we can because, um, as we just discussed, the propagator provides information about the correlation strengths, therefore about distances, space-time distances. And what does the metric do? It provides information about infinitesimal space-time distances. And so maybe it's no surprise that you can get it from the propagator. It provides even finite information about finite space-time distances, so in particular also about infinitesimal ones. Now that means that we have a new way to express um, space times. Ordinarily, we would desc describe a space time as a differentiable manifold, M with a metric G on it, or perhaps as, an, as a differentiable manifold M with a Christoffel symbol, a, a connection on it. But we now see that we can describe space time also as a different differentiable manifold with a propagator on it. That's an equivalent way of describing the space time. But we're not done yet. We also want to go beyond coordinate systems. Why? Well, remember, our aim is to pass integrate over geometries. But the problem is that the propagator, G2 of X and Y, it depends on the geometry, of course, because, because we just saw it encodes the geometry. If you know the propagator on a curved space time, you can calculate what the metric is. So it depends on the geometry, but it also depends on the coordinate system, right? The differentiable manifold still needs a coordinate system here. And when we then write our propagator in that coordinate system, there's a functional dependence on it. If you change coordinates, the propagator looks different. And that is the problem that I was referring to at the beginning on the first slide. We can't just path integrate over all propagators because we would be path integrating over both geometry and coordinate system choices. It's the same with path integrating over the metric. We would be 
plus integrating over geometries and over different morphisms, over just coordinate systems. And the second makes no sense. We need to mod out by coordinate systems. So obviously, uh, um, a plausible idea might be to say, well, the propagator does contain the geometric information and the coordinate system information, but let's just extract the geometric information in the pure form from the propagator. But how can we do that? Well, we can view the propagator as an operator. In fact, it is the right inverse of the D'Alembert of a wave operator. In the simplest case, um, the wave operator is the box, is the D'Alembert. So uh, the, the propagator is the right inverse of the D'Alembert operator. And operators have spectra. The Dunbar is a self-adjoint operator, and um, we can diagonalize it, and its spectrum is coordinate system invariant. So it seems like we arrived to where we wanted to arrive. We have found a way to extract coordinate system invariant information from our Green's function, from our propagator. Namely, we just view it as an operator and then take its spectrum or the spectrum of its inverse. And that's coordinate system invariant. So can we, can we do this? Can we just path integrate now over the spectra in the hope that this amounts to path integrating over the uh, geometric information about ge over geometry? Remember the spectrum is coordinate system invariant. So if we do that, we are not unnecessarily path integrating over human choices anymore. But the question is, of course, whether we extract it by this method of taking the spectrum, whether we extracted all of the geometric information that was contained in the propagator. We have therefore arrived at the field of spectral geometry. It goes back to Hermann Weil 115 years ago. So uh, Weil, of course, didn't consider the Renzi manifold. So the, the key question of spectral geometry is, does the spectrum of the operator, the wave operator contain all of the geometric information or perhaps only some of it? And the answer is no, it does not contain all of the geometric information, it contains only some of it. But why? How did we lose geometric information? We had the propagator that provably has all the information about the metric, because we have the explicit formula for reconstructing the metric. And then we just calculated the spectrum of it. We know it's coordinate system invariant, but somehow in that process of distilling that just spectral information, we lost some of the geometric information. How could that happen? Let's see how that could happen in order to fix it. So how can we fix spectral geometry? So here's the problem. The propagator G2 of X and Y contains, we know, all information about the metric. But its spectrum alone, while being coordinate system invariant, does not contain all information about the metric. Now, why would that be? Here's the reason. The spectrum of the propagator is invariant under the full unitary group of the manifold. The geometric invariants that we are looking for, namely the geometric invariants, are invariants that are required to be invariant only under the diffeomorphism, under the diffeomorphism group. Now you see the diffeomorphism group is huge, but the unitary group is way bigger. The diffeomorphism group contains all the changes of coordinates, but the unitary group contains changes of coordinates and things like Fourier transforms and Hermit transforms and transformations that are going way beyond coordinate transformations. You see, that's why we lost geometric information to, by going to the spectrum. We required, we, we distilled too much. We required the invariance to be invariant under a much larger group, the unitary group, than the group we're really interested in, which is the diffeomorphism group. You see, the smaller the requirements are, the larger the, the number of invariants is that you get. So we modded out by too much. So what can we do here? The propagator and its spectrum, and the spectrum of the propagator does contain geometric information, but not enough. Now here's the solution. 
And the solution is to remember that in quantum field theory, we have not just propagators, we also have interactions. We also have higher point correlators. In the simplest case, in the lowest order tree approximation, this would be vertices. Let's consider also these gn, these uh, endpoint functions for n larger than two in any basis, given in a position basis, momentum basis, or whatever basis in the Hilbert space of fields that you want to consider. Let's say we have one of those as well, like a four vertex of a phi to the four theory. And remember that this changes the spectral geometry. We're no longer just listening to the sound of an object, like listening to the sound of a drum. Remember spectral geometry asks, for example, can you hear the shape of a drum? Here, we are, when we are considering the GN for N larger two, we are assuming that the vibrations of the drum are no longer linear, no longer harmonic, because we have interactions between the fields that live on the manifold, self-interactions or interactions among them. Anyway, so let's consider one of these vertices in whatever basis in the Hilbert space. Now, since interactions in physics as far as we know, are all local, it means that these vertices, these endpoint functions, are diagonal only in the position basis. In every position basis, they are diagonal, but only in position basis. That is expressing the very locality of interactions. But this means that we can identify, given the vertex, in whatever basis, we can identify position basis. We can identify position representation. But then we're done. Because if in the Hilbert space, we can identify the position basis, let's say by diagonalizing a four vertex, then we can transform into that basis. And we get from the spectrum of our propagator, we get now the propagator into position basis. Remember that if you know the spectrum of an operator, you know it in its eigenbasis. If you also know where the position basis is, you can do the transformation into the position basis. But we know from the previous results that if we know the propagator in the position basis, well, then we can calculate the metric there. So this means that if we know the, the correlators, the two-point correlators of a quantum field on a curved space-time, along with higher point correlators, at least one of them, then we don't need to know them in a position basis. We just need to know them abstractly in any basis or basis independently, say given by commutators or something like that. Then we can identify what the metric is. We can calculate the metric explicitly. Um, going back to the intuition of spectral geometry, the question there was, can you hear the shape of a drum? And the answer is generally not. You can construct special cases where you can, but generally not. But what if the drum is nonlinear? What if it matters how hard you hit the drum? Then you can. Now what this suggests is a picture of physics as information theory. Um, let me explain. So in principle, we can think of the endpoint, the two point correlator, the propagator, as being a tool to reconstruct the metric. But remember, our aim here is to quantize gravity. And we know that we should not expect the notion of a metric to make sense in all regimes. We expect that as we approach the Planck scale, the very notion of a metric might not make much sense. But the notion of correlator might be more robust. Correlators might make sense in all regimes. In practice, it means here that for what we just talked about, the diagonalizability of our correlators, of our vertex correlators, is not guaranteed mathematically. Remember that these are endpoint functions for n larger than two. The GN are not self adjoint operators. They are operators that act on multiple, uh, on multiple tensor products of fields into the op and into the space of fields. There is no spectral geometry, there is no spectral theorem that guarantees diagonalizability here. No, the only reason why we can diagonalize is physical. It's that we have the notion of locality. 
locality means that the vertices are in the position basis diagonal. But as I said, the mathematics doesn't require it. It could easily happen that at sufficiently high energies, the correlators, the endpoint correlators for n larger than two may no longer be exactly diagonalizable. But if these are the fundamental quantities that carry the physical information, then, well, that's possible. But in that case, we can no longer exactly obtain the propagate in a position basis. Because if we can't diagonalize the vertices, we don't, oh, sorry about it. Um, because if we um, cannot um, diagonalize the, the, the vertices, then we can't identify in the abstract Hilbert space where the position bases are. Therefore, we cannot write the propagate in the position basis. Therefore, we cannot calculate the metric. Now, it's not just a yes and no thing. What could happen is that as we approach higher and higher energies, as we approach the Planck scale, um, the vertices become slowly less and less accurately di diagonalizable. They are no longer quite diagonal, which means we can no longer completely be sure about where the position basis is, or even have a clean position basis, just approximately. So we can approximately write the propagator in a position basis, and then we can approximately get a metric. But you see, as we approach them higher and higher energies, we see maybe simply eventually just lose diagonalizability because mathematics is not forcing it. And then uh, we lose the ability to construct a metric and therefore a metric space-time manifold. But we still have full control over this, the tower of all the endpoint correlators. So it seems that the endpoint correlators are a more robust concept than uh, the concept of metric. But correlators, abstract correlators, not correlators in space-time or in momentum space, but just abstract correlators in whatever basis in the Hilbert space of fields, these abstract correlators, um, when well, they can continue to contain all the information about physical degrees of freedom and information is here the operational word because correlators are more or less directly notions of information. What do you know about this if you know that? That's what, um, that's what correlators express. So it appears that if we um, make the conjecture that the matter degrees of freedom, along with the gravitational degrees of freedom, as we saw, are all encoded in the correlators, then we seem to arrive at a robust picture and a picture that's fundamentally information theoretic. Now, what determines the abstract correlators? What's the, what would be the physical laws that determine the abstract correlators GN? Well, if the GN are correlators, then they must be of the form of all correlators, which is that they have to be an average where we integrate over so many random variables, phi, with some weight function. Now, what could that weight function be? Well, it's not a mystery. We know what the weight function is, at least at low energies. You see, at low energies, we know that the weight function, W of phi, is the classical action. You see, it's just, just substitute for W of phi, the classical action, you get the path integral. <clears throat> and what is the classical action? Well, in the simplest case, the classical action would be, for example, the, the action for a real scalar Klein-Gordon field, massless Klein-Gordon field. So that would be this action here, one half the integral over phi, then inversion phi. Now, remember our ambition here is to get rid of coordinate systems, to write things in a way that doesn't depend on uh, whether you work in position space, momentum space, or whatever representation. It's just abstract in the Hilbert space of fields that you work in. And let's just rewrite that action for later use uh, abstractly without choosing a basis. And we can do it this way. This integral can be viewed as being the trace of the Dunn-Bershon operator as an abstract operator in the Hilbert space of fields acting on these phi phi, which are just the abstract vectors corresponding to these concrete functions of space and time. Well, this is, of course, this cat bra notation is a little bit of an abuse of notation because well, it just means abstract vectors in the Hilbert space of fields that we formally integrate over in the path integral. These are not the states of the quantum field theory, of course. Right, so if you introduce here, for example, the, uh, if you write the trace, as an integral over the position basis, 
then you see that this expression here on the left reduces to that on the right. But the expression on the left is more general because you know it also holds in curved space time and so on. It's just basis independent. Now, how can we include gravity? You see, if we work with the action, um, as we just said, and with this trace form and so on, that's all fine, but it seems to be just a matter action. How can we include gravity here? Well, let's see. How can we gravity? How can we include gravity in the action? How can we include gravity then in the path integral? Let's make an assumption here. Let's make the assumption that there is an ultraviolet cutoff um, in in the field, um, which means, uh, I mean, that literally just a hard cutoff, which is a, a largest momentum squared, which means a cutoff on the spectrum of the D'Alembert operator. If we do that, then we are in business with Sakharov. Sakharov and his induced gravity. Sakharov made the point in 1969, I think a super important point, which it took him only half a page to make. This is one of the shortest papers ever, Sakharov's induced gravity, just half a page. He made the point that if you have a cutoff in a quantum field theory on curved space time, then the counter terms that are being produced by renormalization will be of all forms, generically, of all forms allowed by the symmetries of the theory. And that includes, and that was Sakharov's point, that includes a cosmological constant term and the Einstein-Hilbert action and higher order curvature terms, which are heavily suppressed. The, con the cosmological constant term is, of course, heavily too, too heavy. Um, but if you choose the cutoff at the Planck scale, then the Einstein term actually comes up with the exact, exactly correct prefactor. And so in abstractly formulated, what Sakharov said, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, is that if you do quantum field theory on a space time that you allow to be curved, expect a leading term in the action, a leading constant term in the action, just this mu times the identity in the action where mu is a constant that we can determine in a moment. So the claim is that just adding an identity here to the trace is adding the Einstein action along with a cosmological constant that we don't want and higher order curvature terms that we don't need. Um, but this just this identity introduces the Einstein action. We'll see that in a moment how that actually comes up explicitly. So how do we enter then gravity also in the path integral. So far, we just added it to the action. You see, we might add it right here already with explicitly because by counter terms, we're going to get it anyway. Um, so um, gravity in the path integral, how can we add this in the path integral, not just into the action? Well, we need to integrate over all possible spectra of our propagator and all diagonalizable vertices GN, where this diagonalizable, I put in quotation marks here because it's a non-trivial question um, that we can discuss later, if you wish. Yeah, in five minutes, uh, Oh, yes, thank you. And, um, and secondly, we, if we want to pass integrate over geometries, then we need to not just integrate over the spectra, but we also need um, to sum over the number of dimensions of the ultraviolet cutoff Hilbert space of fields. You see, we've only cut off the spectrum, but we have not cut off how many eigenvalues there might be in the spectrum. So we have to sum over all possibilities there too. So I want to give you a simple example. I will leave off with that. Just a simple example of how that looks. When you, do, when you try to do quantum gravity from this simple perspective here, where we just uh, try to avoid coordinate systems at all costs. <laughs> no rods, no clocks, no coordinate system, everything completely abstract so that we don't have to mod out by these things later on. So the, simple exam the simplest example that I could come up with is four-dimensional Euclidean massless real-valued Klein-Gordon field with an ultraviolet cutoff. And that's supposed to live on a compact Riemannian manifold of four dimensions, right? So let's, let's try this simple ansatz here. Now we can use results of Gilkey in spectral geometry and Hawking to show that in this special case, 
what I showed you earlier, this thing here, this just adding the identity, a multiple of the identity to the trace is actually adding the Einstein action here. Namely, it turns out that the trace of the identity, right? So this, this thing here, trace of the identity up to prefactor, numerical prefactor, the trace of the identity is of course the dimension of the Hilbert space, right? The trace of the identity in the Hilbert space is the dimension of the Hilbert space. But it was shown that the dimension of the Hilbert space that you obtained by cutting off the spectrum of the D'Alembertian or the Laplacian at uh, the scale lambda is given by this expression. And this expression shows you it's the Einstein Hilbert action with a prefactor lambda over six times you know, one over 16 pi squared, et cetera, and the higher order curvature terms and the leading cosmological constant. So in practice, you know, if you actually write it out again in the position representation, you see that this innocent looking thing has a metamorphosis and it looks like that. It does cover what we want, the Einstein action. As I said, more actually cosmology constant and higher order curvature terms, but we have the Einstein action. But the key, of course, is that we don't want to use this whole mess here on the right hand side. That's super complicated. No, we want to use this part here, which is so simple, right? Basis independently is way simpler. And let's do that now. And I just want to demonstrate that we can actually calculate the partition function in this case where the partition function is obtained by path integrating both the matter, which is in this case, just the Klein-Gordon field, but also the gravity. Meaning we integrate, we path integrate over all possible spectra. See, we don't have vertices in this, so we don't need to path integrate over, over the vertices just yet. It's a free Klein-Gordon field uh, on a space time. So when we calculate the partition function basis independently, it is taking this form. The partition function is the sum over all possible numbers of dimensions of the Hilbert space, which is to say all possible numbers of eigenvalues we can have in the spectrum. And we integrate, we path integrate, that's this integral here, over all fields phi. And we integrate over all possible values that the eigenvalues can take. See, we have capital N eigenvalues and each eigenvalue ranges from zero to the cutoff lambda. But if we do this like that, then we count every spectrum multiple times. How often? N factorial times. Because the first eigenvalue could be five, the second eigenvalue could be seven, or the other way around, it's the same spectrum, but we get it twice, right? So we have to divide by this combinatorial factor here. And then here's e to the power of the action and here's uh, yeah, the integral over all the eigenvalues. Let's make that even more explicit. Let's choose the eigenbasis of the D'Alembertian for convenience. If we choose the eigenbasis of the D'Alembertian, then we get instead of the D'Alembertian simply the eigenvalues lambda n. And we get instead of the phi, the abstract field phi, we get its coefficients in the eigenbasis of the D'Alembertian. And that's just these phi squares. And the rest is just integration and summation. And it turns out we can, we're just lucky in this case, we can actually do all of these integrals and sums. If you first do the Gaussian integrals, then you get factors of square root of pi over lambda n's. And you can integrate those lambda n's all from zero to the cutoff. And then you get some expression and that expression needs to be summed over all n from n to infinity. And yep, it can all be done. It just happens to be simple in this case. And we get the partition function explicitly. Okay, so what I wanted um, to say in this talk is this. Here's a summary and a quick outlook. Summary is this. Uh, rods and clocks are funny because they are not um, uh, covariant objects. They are human made. And rods and clocks are indeed replaceable by something more canonical. That's nature made instead of human made. And that's the strength of correlations uh, of quantum vacuum fluctuations. And that means that we can express the metric tensor. Uh, in fact, we can replace it. Um, wherever it occurs, we can replace it by just a correlator, which is to propagate it. But the propagator is at, at this stage of our investigation, it was still a function of positions x and y. It's a bi-scalar. 
And we lamented that this means that the propagator contains geometric information, all right, because it expresses the metric, but also the human made choice of um, coordinate system, which we wanted to get rid of. And then we upgraded that. And we found that the metric can also be expressed in terms of abstract correlators, namely the two-point correlator and some other vertex, some other three or four or whatever vertex. They can be given basis independently. They don't have to be given in a, in a position basis. And we can nevertheless always calculate the metric from them because this guy is diagonal only in position basis, which allows us to identify the position basis. And then we can write G2 in the position basis. And from there, we are back to here where we can calculate the metric. Then we said, well, this opens up a possibility for a description of Planck scale physics, if all of this makes sense. Namely, <clears throat> the abstract GN can persist in their role even when they are not diagonalizable. That is to say, even when no metric can be uh, inferred from them. So in, in this sense, the abstract correlators are a more robust description of geometric and matter degrees of freedom than um, taking a metric for the geometry and taking a fields for matter. The GN just contain all of that in, in one go. And since the correlators are literally correlators, um, we arrive at a picture where all of the physical information of matter and geometry is encoded in the correlators and therefore in an information theoretic way. And at the end, I, I demonstrated that at least simple path integrals over fields and gravity are doable in this way. But of course, it was way too simple. And what was really missing here is um, having the vertices too. But of course, that makes the theory nonlinear. And probably that can only be done uh, perturbatively. Also, maybe in simple enough cases, it might be doable also non perturbatively. Uh, quick outlook. Well, um, it would be super interesting to be able to carry out some matter gravity path integrals like that, but with field interactions to obtain a quantized space time along with a quantized matter. And what we have to expect here is that the path integrals become rather difficult. And everybody knows that path integrals are analytically ill-defined. And um, I would like to refer here to a paper that I wrote with uh, David Jackson and Alejandro Morales, where we uh, re-express the path integral um, algebraically and combinatorially in order to make it robust against analytic issues. OK, um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Achim. Thank you. All right, so we open the floor for questions now. As usual, please use the raise hand feature uh, so I can see your hand. Okay, Jorma. Jorma, go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, very Hello. interesting. Uh, so uh, you specifically took G2 to be the Feynman propagator. Why Feynman as opposed to, say, the Whiteman function? Um, yes, it turns out that um, what we could show is that it doesn't matter what boundary condition you choose. So you could choose, for example, a retarded propagator or advanced propagator or Feynman propagator. It turns out that it doesn't care which homogeneous solution you slap on to the inhomogeneous solution. But if you were to take a homogeneous solution itself, I don't know whether we could do it. I think the information is probably in it, but our formula would not apply. But it's a good question. I, I'd, I'd love to know the answer to that too. <laughs> but it's, it's it, I think um, we, we, we chose the Feynman propagator because it's the tree level, um, it's the simplest tree level for the, uh, for the, for the actual um, propagator, for the, full, for the full propagator. Because what we actually measure, if we go out there and measure the correlators, then um, it would be, a two-point function that has all the summation, of course, in it. If, if I may continue, I was uh, sort of anticipating that you might mention continuing from Lorentz signature to positive definite signature. Did this have any role in your choice of, of the Feynman propagator? 
Oh, are you referring to the fact that if you start with uh, the safe, uh, the mathematically safer territory of the Euclidean signature, then big rotation uh, leads you to the Feynman propagator? Um, that wasn't actually the motivation. And I have to say, it's very non trivial because on cur generic curved space time, I don't think it's still the case that you automatically arrive at the Feynman propagator. And in fact, it cannot be the case, right? Uh, in, in fact, in generic curved space times where one part is expanding, another one is shrinking, or a third part is doing its own thing, um, they're different observers. I mean, there will not be a state that all observers would agree on is the state of uh, no particles. And so we were quite happy to find that the choice of vacuum doesn't matter um, in the calculation from, uh, of the metric from the correlator. Right, any more questions? Cisco, go ahead. Um, I also really enjoyed that talk. That was that was very interesting. I wanted to ask, has there been any work done to quantify the kind of induced uncertainty that uh, not being able to diagonalize uh, some of the higher end correlators will induce? Because you mentioned that you can only approximately construct the metric at high energies using this method. I was just curious if you've done anything to characterize exactly would, what limitations. I would love to know the answer to this question. Um, I think it, uh, it, the challenge is this. If we wanted to, do, to answer that question in the usual position representation, what you would have to do is uh, try to quantize gravity one way or the other, and just do the renormalization program and then see what happens to quantum field theory as we approach the Planck scale. But we all know there's this issue of non renormalizability of gravity and we get stuck in the process. Here, we would work in a basis independent way and try to generalize the toy example that I gave here. And um, yeah, it, it, it might be possible then, in, at least in some toy examples, to calculate um, how the diagonalizability of the vertices might get lost as we approach extreme scales. But um, I have not done the calculation. But it's, um, it's all still very new. I mean, um, I hope yeah. that the paper will come out soon, but um, I have not actually published on that yet. Okay. It's all very new. All right. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fascinating. All right, thank you, Cisco. Alex? Thank you, thank you for the lecture. So, if I understood it right, the the correlation functions you are calculating are from the scalar field which sources the curvature, right? The matter. In this case, yes. In this case, it was just the scalar field. Okay, and but this scalar field is defined in a more fundamental Minkowski space time, right? So we have this fundamental Minkowski space time. Or where everything happens, and then it gives a preferred vacuum and everything we have in Minkowski space-time. Is, is that right? Um, I don't quite understand your question about the preferred vacuum. Because uh, remember that if you have the propagator, it doesn't matter in how you define the vacuum. Which, uh, whatever definition of the vacuum gives you a propagator, but all those propagators give you the same metric. Okay, okay. No, I, I was just asking because you have uh, the preferred vacuum because you have the symmetries of the Minkowski space time, right? Oh, no, no, I'm not working with Minkowski space time here. But the scalar field is defined on a Minkowski space time. No, 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 you can define it on any curved space time. I don't think it's sourcing curvature, though. I think it's just a, right? I think it's a scalar field on a curved space time, correct? No, no, here in this case, it is source and curvature. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Oh, yeah, it you. does, yeah, yeah. But then the question that Alex asked makes sense, I think. Um, can you carry paraphrase it? Can you just rephrase it? Maybe I, I get it better then. Maybe. So, well, so, so the, uh, if you have a scalar field source in space time here, right, uh, you have to quantize a scalar field. 
So yeah. there you need, uh, you have a state independent expression, but you need a quantization scheme. And uh, I think Alex is asking is you taking a break, the usual Minkowski kind of uh, vacuum quantization scheme. Choosing a vacuum is equivalent to choosing a quantization. Oh, oh. oh yeah, yeah. But, but you remember that my toy example here was, um, I just to say, the toy example here was in the Euclidean signature case. And there, um, you know, you don't have the Dallon-Bershin, which is hyperbolic. You have the Laplacian, which is elliptic, and there's no boundary condition to be made here. And it was just like as Roma said, it's implied then that you would have the, the family propagator in this case. Or, um, yeah. And, and so the quantization of the, the field of phi is just the path integral over all the coefficients phi n in the basis of, in the eigenbasis of the Laplacian. It's just a path in the curl in the Euclidean case, and there is no choice of vacuum to be made. It's just, okay. yeah. It's just a yeah, simple it's case. The question didn't come up yet it's because it's too simple. Also, the, the fact that you're integrating over all possible uh, spectra for the, the Laplacian means that in the end, like uh, it's as if you were integrating over every single possible quantization scheme for this uh, field phi in the end. Or is it well right to think of it? Yeah, well, uh, in, in some sense, yes. You see, if you say, if you mean by quantization scheme that you have to choose what manifold you quantize your phi on, then yes, because we are at the same time summing over all possible manifolds represented by all possible spectra. And we are also pass integrating the fields over them. And ordinarily, that would be a super messy thing because you would have a field phi living on a space time in a, with a coordinate system, let's say. And then you would say, okay, uh, if I change the shape of the space time, then um, how do I appropriately change the field phi on it? How can I say it's the same field phi on, on that space time and so on? But these questions don't arise in this formalism because it's simply, the field is a vector in the Hilbert space on which the D'Alembertian acts. And the D'Alembertian spectrum can change and the coefficients of the phi can change. And you never need to bother about, you know, coordinates and how coordinates um, relate to each other as you compare to manifolds and so on, because you've just modeled out this whole business with the, uh, with the um, different morphisms and the coordinate system. Okay, right. thank you. I have a, a, a quick question, uh, probably related. In the in the expression you give for the um, for the metric in the end to recover the metric of the propagator, right? Uh, you uh, you recover in the coincidence limit. Typically, the in the coincidence limit of the Feynman propagator is singular. Where the distribution is singular, is that a problem or is there some? So usually, I mean, singular in the sense you can renormalize it and you end up with a scale, right? If it's in a curved space, then could be cur the curvature scale or something like that. But usually it's introducing some scale, right? Is that something that uh, you have to do or? I mean, it's just, I mean, I may be ignoring something very basic in this, but typically, um, yeah, go ahead. Right, right. So a good question because I, it also helps me answer a question that came up earlier uh, from Roman. The thing is that the, um, the propagator is differentiated, but first it is inverted. We take an inverse power of the propagator mm -hmm. oh. and then we differentiate it and then we take the coincidence limit. And it is also because we take the inverse power of the propagator that the I epsilon drops out, right? Because you can take right. the limit before or after the coincidence limit. Ha, huh, yeah, okay, so that, the, the, okay, I get it. So the limit doesn't, the object would not be defined the coincidence limit, but you take the limit at the end yeah. and you don't have the problem and you don't have to introduce extra scale then it's getting <coughs> Yeah. Got it, all right. Thank you, Achim. Any, any more questions, anybody? All right, if not, let's thank Aki Mary Aki. Great talk as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, very nice. Let me pause the recording. The next speaker of the session is Laura Henderson uh, from the University of Waterloo, and she's going to talk about detecting a band limit in a quantum field. So, Laura, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you for uh, organizing this to both the organizers and especially these long sessions. Um, so I'm gonna be discussing some older work. I think some of you have seen a, a talk very similar to this, but not everyone has. 
So I'm going to take this as an opportunity to discuss detecting a band limit on a quantum field. This is work I've done in collaboration with uh, Nick Minacucci and at RMIT. So why do we care about this band limit? Akim uh, touched on this a bit in his talk, but to just sort of reframe the question, get everyone on the same page is, it's to answer uh, one of these big, well, to approach coming up with an answer. Uh, but one of the big questions in physics is what happens at the largest energy scales. So these large energy scales um, are associated at a very small distance, distances at Planck length or, or even smaller. And it's widely thought that at these distances, the notion of space-time itself can break down, perhaps due to quantum fluctuations or something else. Uh, many, there have been many, many approaches to solving this problem. I've listed a couple of references, but you know, take your pick of um, these approaches. And most of them predict some limit on small measurements of distance, whether or not that's through, um, say, loop quantum gravity, there's a, a finite length or uh, string theory, things become really weird and foamy, or, or again, take your pick. And one approach is to actually introduce the notion of a finite minimum length uncertainty. And that's the one that uh, will motivate band limit quantum field theory. As Akim showed uh, in 2000, that it's been, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence. So minimum length uncertainty is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a band limit quantum field. So just uh, very generally, there's two main ways that people put a band limit on a, on a quantum field. One is I'm going to call the conventional limit, and that's simply to cut off the cut off the momentum modes of the field and say nothing can propagate greater um, nothing can propagate if it's larger than some band limit lambda. Now this maintains the Euclidean symmetries of the space, but uh, not the full Lorentz symmetries. And mathematically, this cuts off the spectrum of the Laplacian. The second is more complicated. You can cut off the spectrum of the D'Alembertian, as I can was speaking about previously, and that will maintain full Lorentz symmetries. And just to give a, a quick picture of what's going on in this scheme, modes with very large optional momentum have a very small bandwidth, so they don't propagate very far or for a very long amount of time. Now, this talk is gonna be taking the simplest approach, so we'll be using a conventional band limit, which does pick out a scale and a preferred frame. Our previous work has looked at this band limit in, one, in a one plus one dimensional scalar field. And uh, that was done by Jason uh, previously. And it's shown that this field has degrees of freedom that occupy an incompressible spatial volume. So there's a finite volume to the space time. There's modifications of both the two point correlators and entanglement entropy, as well as other things. And these modifications um, are these modifications depend on the distance between, between uh, points that you're looking at with the least modifications occurring at distances of pi over lambda, lambda being your band limit. So what are we looking to detect? Why use detectors? Um, it seems like the next, the next logical step because one of the things, you know, there's a couple of questions we can ask, could we detect a band limit? And what does this incompressible volume mean? So we know that the degrees of freedom occupy an incompressible volume. What happens if you put a detector smaller than that? And, or does that even make sense? Um, we know um, from work done by Emma uh, in 2017 that a band limit uh, will modify the shape of the detector. But then how, does, how is that going to change the ability of the detector to detect a band limit? How is it going to change the entanglement harvesting capabilities? And I'll make those concepts a bit more precise later on. And of course, again, in labs, we can't measure a field directly. We're always gonna couple something to that field and then measure the response of that something. So as you've seen many times throughout these series of talks, um, um, we use the Enriduit detector model as our detector. And to remind you, it's a two line level energy system separated by an energy gap omega. And it's a detector. Particle detection means the detector clicks, transitions from ground to excited. They couple linearly, they're coupled linearly to a quantum scalar field at some place, so the notion of locality for some time. And this is a sensible model to use. It's shown to be a good approximation of the light matter interaction with some approximations when no angular momentum is exchanged. And this model has been refined uh, and refined um, over the years. But we'll be using the simple case. And then just uh, kind of to discuss entanglement harvesting. 
It's where you take a pair of initially separable uh, UDW detectors, so say ground, ground, no correlations between them, and interact them with a quantum scalar field um, for some time and then look at their entanglement after. And they usually become entangled after this interaction. It happens, it can happen if the detectors are space like separated through the interaction. And the amount of entanglement is highly sensitive to both the properties of the field and the detector. And that's both a blessing and a curse, depending on how you think about it. This means that this entanglement harvesting scheme is incredibly sensitive to, um, you can, to say the topology of the space time, presence of horizons, boundary conditions. And so you can use it to detect um, these, these properties. Um, it's been, and one example where that's been done is it's been shown to that these that we can use entanglement harvesting to distinguish between a de Sitter space time and a thermal bath of the same temperature. Or, and again, many of these other papers are using the sensitivity of these detectors to detect a wide variety of things. So just to put a bit of, finally throw a bit of math at the screen, I'm sure most of you have seen this before, but we're gonna initialize the system in uh, the state here. So detector A is in the ground, detector B is in the ground and the field, scalar field is in the vacuum. We're gonna evolve it through this interaction Hamiltonian where we've got the interaction strength, switching functions, so turning it on and off. This is the monopole moment and incorporates the internal degrees of freedom of the detector and you've got a smeared scalar field. Um, and then you're you know, gonna evolve your system to the final state for the usual time evolution operator, trace out the field, and in the perturbative case, you end up with a density matrix that looks like this. The quantities to pay attention to are your PA and PB, which are your transition probabilities of your detector, and X encodes your non-local correlations between those two detectors. So again, let's make the band limit a bit more precise now. As I mentioned before, we're gonna take the simplest model, a hard UV cutoff. Again, it's gonna pick out a preferred frame. And so we're gonna cut off, uh, we're gonna expand the field in plane wave modes and cut it off, not allowing modes with a momentum greater than the band limit. So you basically wind up with your field looking like this. And so your interaction, so you shove this back with your interaction Hamiltonian and you're, you wind up with this, where you've got this uh, F tilde D as the Fourier transform of your smearing function, which I also have been calling the spatial profile. So we can, uh, there's a different way of writing that rather than writing the cutoff down here, we can integrate over all momentum modes K, but put on a uh, rectangular function to cut off the modes that way. But what's nice, what's interesting is that as shown by Daniel and uh, Irene in 2019 that you can rewrite these, combine these two things, and wind up with a new spatial profile, G, which I will also call the effective spatial profile. Now that, I think this, uh, by doing this, you can really see the non-locality show up. So there, here's what your new spatial profile will look like for a transform of your rectangular function involved with your old profile. And in the example of if your detector is point-like, so it can be represented as a delta function, your effective spatial profile looks like this, where your J1 is a spherical vessel function of the first kind. And if you look at this, it has a fall off of one over R squared. And that's a pretty, pretty slow fall off, all things considered, considering most people will put Gaussians uh, on their detector. So you can see that this non-locality in the, in the modes of the field can be rewritten as this huge non-locality in the detectors themselves. So now that I've looked at what's gonna to happen to the detectors, I'll just tell you how we're gonna set up this problem. Uh, we're gonna take two point like UDW detectors. So they'll have the effective spatial profile I showed on the previous slide. And we're gonna make set them to have identical energy gaps separated by some distance S. The switching function will just be your standard Gaussian here. And in doing this, they're gonna have identical transition probabilities. So what can we learn from one detector? There is a modification to its transition probability. Now, first in the inset here, that's zooming up at this part of the graph. That's showing that um, for different band limits, that there is uh, the excitation probability of the detector has been decreased. 
but it's really only noticeable for small energy gaps and small uh, and small omega. And I, but, but if you look over here at the um, de excitation part, so a negative uh, energy gap is equivalent to starting the detector in the excited state. So this is the probability that it's going to de excitate. So over here, you see that there's a significant change to this de-excitation probability. In fact, if, the, if the, excite, the detector has an energy gap larger than the band limit, it's not going to be able to de-excite. It's going to, um, the transition probability rapidly falls off to zero. And we interpret this as thinking that in such a field, there's no available modes for the emitted quanta. Now, if you remember, this was done perturbatively. This is to lowest order. So this only allows for single photon uh, de-excitations. And looking at that de-excitation probability a bit more carefully, you can see that as you increase the energy gap and of course the band limit to follow, this turnover gets sharper and sharper and sharper as, you, as the band limit, as the energy gap increases. Now, if you were to look at this critical point, which I think I, which I define sort of right at this point where the, it begins to turn over, it's always, it's always slightly higher, that's the pink line here, than the band limit, the black dotted line. But as you take omega to infinity, it begins to asymptote to that black line. And we think that this, uh, the smoothing effect that happens at low energies is due to some time energy uncertainty at small band limits, which of course are in units of sigma being the units of the switching, there's a bit of uncertainty into the actual um, actual value of that energy gap, and so it can it has a, it's an easier time de-exciting and acting as a lower energy gap. So that's what one detector can tell us. What can two tell us? Well, we're gonna, as I promised, look at this uh, entanglement harvesting protocol, and we're gonna quantify the entanglement through the negativity, which is an entanglement monotone for two qubit or qubit Q-trait system. If you were to write that, um, if you remember that, energy, that uh, density matrix I showed previously to lowest order mu interaction strength, I, you can write the negativity like this. But because we have identical transition probabilities, it simplifies significantly and it's now the maximum of zero, so, or, or X minus P D. And that's nice uh, because in a, you know, if you just look at this formula, you can get a nice physical picture of what's going on. The detectors are entangled if the non-local correlations are larger than the local noise of the detectors. Um, so what happens? How is, how is entanglement harvesting uh, modified by this band limit? So in these two plots, I'm, I have the detectors separated at different distances. Um, they are set to an energy gap of 0.01 in units of the switching. And they're, se so two, and they're separated by two different distances. The red line is, of course, the negativity as you vary the band limit. And this black dotted line you can see here and here is the non-band limited value. So there are regions in the parameter space where the band limit can enhance the amount of entanglement. So for example, here and here. There are also regions where it can be decreased. And at very small band limit, um, you're not going to be able to entangle the detectors. Now, over here, if they're separated by a larger distance, it can actually allow for regions of harvesting in otherwise inaccessible regions of the parameter space. So if there's no band limit, these two detectors in this configuration could not become entangled. But if your band limit was, if you were in a, a interacting with a quantum field that had a band limit of say six in units of your switching, then you can actually get a non-zero non entanglement uh, negativity and see that these detectors are entangled. Uh, we can interpret this uh, as a result from the non-locality of the detectors themselves rather than the one locality of the field, of the uh, degrees of freedom of the field. If you remember that there is a very slow fall off of the detectors effective profile, then you could imagine that then some sense there, the two detectors are overlapping and of course, uh, they're more likely to become entangled there. Of course, that's they're not actually overlapping. It, uh, we've set this problem up by implementing a band limit, but mathematically they are the same. So what can you do with this? Well, let's say, I mean, looking at this plot and I say, oh, well, the detect, and I, let's say I have um, 
live in a quantum, have a quantum field where the band limit is now four in units of sigma. Well, if you notice, the negativity there in this particular setup is zero. So that's not going to be able to tell you any because you expect a non-band limited case to also be zero. But what we can do is we can set up, we can tune the, the detector setup. So it's energy gap and separation to actually fill in all of those little, all of those spaces um, in, in your uh, graph here. So actually, we can actually say, um, use that to put a lower bound on the band limit. And five minute warning. Or... That's, that's perfect. Um, so that, and what we've done here is we're checking for a band limit less than 20. If any one of these pairs were showed a non-zero negativity, then we can conclude that there's a band limit less than 20 and perhaps looking at the actual value of negativity, put a more precise bound on that. So can, uh, one thing I had mentioned previously is that um, we were doing this perturbatively and only allowed single photon uh, de-excitations or excitations, so can we go beyond the perturbative results? And the answer is yes, if we take a look at delta switching. Uh, so delta switching is, you can consider that the limit of sudden switching, the switching time is much less than any other scale in, in the problem. And so if we put in a switching function, that's a, a direct delta, we can know the final state of the detectors exactly. Now I'm not gonna get into what these density matrix terms are. Um, Ahmed is going to show that in two talks from now. But all you need to know right now is it's gonna, you can know it exactly. We need to give the detectors now a spatial profile. They can't be a direct delta either to avoid divergences in the transition probability of the second detector. Um, also note that because this is non-perturbative, there's no back reaction and the transition probabilities of the detectors are no longer gonna be the same. So what, can, what do we know? For a single detector, we again see that a small band, that a band limit reduces the transition probability of the detector. And that's nice to know that that holds. Um, of course, the band limit again still needs to be small. And I'm not speaking about de-excitation probability because once you grind through the mathematics of this problem, you see no energy gap dependence with this kind of switching. So excitation probability and de-excitation probability would be the same. Um, we can also ask, well, what's the best kind of, what's the best Gaussian width to detect some band limit? And you can actually find that if you put a certain tolerance of your equipment, so let's say I can only um, determine the transition probability to within 0.02, um, then my best, my best width is actually not as small as possible, but it's um, about 0.2 and, and units of the strength of your switching. So we need a small, but not too small detector to best detect some band limit. Um, so that was a bit surprising. I, 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 that was a bit surprising because you'd assume that the smaller the detector is, the more uh, modes it's sensitive to, so the easier it can detect the band limit. And then uh, quickly to conclude, two detectors are not gonna tell us much more because there's the no-go theorem um, discovered by uh, Peter and Eduardo that states that two detectors that interact with uh, delta switching are never gonna become entangled from a coherent state, including the vacuum, regardless of their spatial profile. And since the band limit is mathematically equivalent to a profile, that's not gonna help. This is not gonna be uh, something to look at. But what if we look at the commutator between the two, the, the, between the two detectors, so how, does the, how the information propagates from one detector to the other, you can actually see a huge dependence on, on the band limit. If you notice this, this function here, the commutator is oscillating wildly. It, uh, well, not wildly, but it's oscillating. And those, it's, you, know, you can still see differences up to a band limit of 200. But unfortunately, it's not appreciable in PB because the decay from the band limit is a much stronger effect. But you do see a little bit of um, an increase in transition probability due to the commutator. If we really wanted to exploit this, we'd want to look at something such as um, quantum flux calling, which is more which is more directly dependent on this commutator. So, in conclusion, a band limit can be detected by detectors. 
reduces both the excitation and de-excitation probability with much, a much more dramatic effect on the excitation probability. We can allow, it allows for entanglement harvesting in regions of the parameter space that are otherwise not accessible, and we can exploit that to put a lower bound on bound limit. In the limit of sudden switching, this bound limit is best detected by detectors that are small, but not infinitesimally small. And these results can be interpreted as um, this bound limit will result in a non-locality. It's you know, it depends on your preference, whether you want to put it in the non-locality in the degrees of freedom of the field or in the detectors themselves. So uh, thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Laura. Let's talk. Questions, uh, please, as usual, raise your hands. Uh, yeah. I can't, I can't see your name, so. Oh, I will tell, I will tell, so don't worry. Okay, great. Uh, so Dan has a question. Dan, go ahead. Hello, Laura. Thank Hi. you for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I had a question, though, about how this um, conventional band limit that you talked about, you mentioned it picks out a special frame. Yeah. I'm wondering how that happens. Does it, does it specify that frame in the dynamics, or does it just write that frame onto the state of the field? It's in the dynamics. It's, in the, it's actually in the field itself. If I put on, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm saying in this frame, this momentum is special. So I, I'm giving a, num a value to sort of a special momentum. And by doing that, I've picked up the frame. Right, right. But my, my thought is that if you then transformed into a different frame, the field would still be band limited just with a different bandwidth. Is that correct? Right. OK. Yeah. OK, yeah, thank you then. All right, thank you, Dan. The next question uh, comes from Achim. Uh, I don't think I'm the next one. There were more hands, right? Was but, that sorry? Sorry? I thought that, I thought I wasn't the next one, but I'm happy to ask. If There's no more hands, hands that I can see. All oh, right, okay. Maybe, maybe people lowered their hands, right. Uh, Laura, I was wondering, um, have you considered applying this um, to the case of uh, phonon, phonon um, replacements of the, of the Klein-Gordon field? What I mean is, if you consider a crystal, it has a natural ultraviolet cutoff. Yeah. And um, I think all of this would straightforwardly apply, except perhaps that in that case, if um, you replace the klein gordon field by a phonon field, you would have non-trivial dispersion relations. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering, have you considered how the dispersion relations would factor into your calculations? I have. Uh, oh. I haven't so far as I'm just trying to pull up that reference. Perhaps I can't quite find it. There it is. This reference here by um, Emma, I know that um, they had considered um, such uh, modified dispersion relations um, mm -hmm. in the context of, uh, I unfortunately, the, the specific context has escaped me. I'm sure Eddie will step in and, and clarify that, but they have they did consider um, modified dispersion relations and how um, different types of, of fall offs rather than just a sharp fall off or that we considered here, but perhaps like an exponential fall off, how that um, works into it. Now, in terms of modified dispersion relations, I think I may have overstated that case. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember multiple different things. This yeah. is some old. This is some older work, and I've had multiple discussions since then. But uh, okay. no, I don't believe they've considered modified dispersion relations. I think Al is working on something similar to that. Right. I think that could be interesting. It wouldn't be the first time that um, fundamental things have an analog in condensed matter physics, and then mm -hmm. in condensed matter physics, our intuition is just um, better, more reliable than it is in in the in the abstract fundamental. Uh, I mean, if the, the picture I had in my head while doing this was some sort of crystal. Mm -hmm. um, just what does, you know, because then because that allowed me to put detectors in that were smaller than some fundamental length. This is what I, this is the picture I was keeping in my head. Okay. I'm surprised no one's uh, asked about that. Yeah. So, so there are, there's uh, in that yeah. paper that you mentioned, as you said, is not uh, what we look at is uh, uh, more how <clears throat> the fact that um, when you have uh, systems in cavities, uh, yeah. you have um, uh, 
yeah, uh, uh, decoupling from the higher uh, frequency mode. So the coupling depends on the frequency uh, on the mode, not but, but not modifying the dispersion relation. I think Dan yeah. is gonna. There's some work that uh, related to work that I've done with Dan and work that Dan is doing on his own as well that is more related to that. I was about to mention, but I see Dan has the hand up, yeah. so probably gonna mention this. <laughs> Uh, no, sorry, Eduardo, uh, you go uh, ahead. Uh, exactly what you're talking about. I have a different okay. question. Okay, well, then I'll mention. Uh, when uh, in inclusion, uh, there is, uh, when you consider uh, band limited theories, um, uh, you do get approximations to the dispersion relation that is related to the band limit. And uh, I, th I think in the case, if you just consider a scalar theory and a band limit, so the, the modification of the dispersion relation that LoRa is definitely, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if you're considering or not, but the modification to the dispersion relation that comes from the fact that you discretize in the, um, you put in the theory in the lattice, you are already considering, right, in your work. You don't have the usual dispersion relation in that case, or do you? So do you? No, I, I, I have the, uh, the only thing I've modified is, like, this is the simplest case you can do, just cut off the modes. Oh, so I see. The dispersion, the dispersion relation is still um, uh, omega equals CK, but we're just now saying that you know high frequencies, high momentum, so they're just throwing out. So this is not uh, theory on a lattice directly. It's a continuum theory, but cutting off uh, momentum. Exactly. Right. Uh, and, and you, can, you can take these theories and put them on a lattice. Yeah. Uh, just, but in that case, you wouldn't get nearest neighbor coupling. You get something much more long range. That's right. Yeah. Um, that. yeah. Oh, in principle, infinite range. You get you get sync. You yeah. A sync lattice that. And you need sync coupling. All right, please, Dan, this has your question. Uh, yeah, my second question was about um, about the smearing function that we put on the probe. Now, if, um, if we're considering a world where fields are fundamentally band limited, I mean, probes are built out of quantum fields, aren't they? So okay, yeah. it's reasonable to assume that we could build a probe which was more localized than the bandwidth allows. Well, yes and no. So, and I, I'm going to answer that because this is something that I actually thought about quite a bit early on. Uh, so, of course, let's assume that the world is made of quantum fields and they all have the same band limit. Then they're not, you're not going to be able to build something smaller than that. Um, let's say that you are a wizard and you could. Because of, of this function here, your smallest length scale is still going to be... A, uh, the, the length scale that matters is going to be the smallest of the, or the, sorry, the largest of the two length scales, whether it's lambda or the length scale of your detector. So if I, rather than using a delta here, I put on a Gaussian and tune the width, um, the, whether it's the width is, um, if the width is smaller than one over lambda, it's, that doesn't change much. That's hardly perceptible. It's only when the width becomes larger than that, larger than your fundamental scale, do you start to see do you start to see significant changes in your results. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So for all practical purposes, smearing functions are always run through this convolution filter. Well, they uh, have to be. Which will wash out any. If you put in details smaller than that, they'll be. Washed they'll out. be washed out by this convolution. Okay. So, so, so that, that's actually what happens, if, if I may add, that's actually what happens in, in what I was mentioning, superconducting circuits, for example, when you have, mm -hmm. a, uh, you have a transmission line, you have a scalar field in that transmission line. For the typical scales uh, that are used in superconducting circuits, you may say, okay, the shape of a superconducting qubit is it related to the physical shape. And you can actually check, to say that, that the scale of the cutoff that in this case is given by the cavity is not is no longer a superconductor for high frequencies. Uh, that's uh, the scale of that cutoff is what actually tells you the shape of the qubit, and it's a huge shape of the qubit. Yeah. So it does this depend. A, this has a, yeah, I mean, this has a quite a low fall off. Right, and it does depend on the scale and the physical models that you're considering, right? So that's that's the yeah. thing. Of course, it's a non-local theory. You need a good reason to make it non-local. I think there's a privileged frame in which we can see that there's some frequency bandwidth that you couple to. It, it makes sense, so, as Nahim was saying, solid state physics, superconducting mm -hmm. cavities, things like that. Crystals. Crystals, yeah, yeah. Any more questions, Dan? Uh, okay, anybody else? Right. 
I have, a, I have a, a quick question for the particular plots that you showed. You did mention it, but I didn't catch it uh, for the harvesting ones. Um, so uh, because these things are very non-local, right? In the distances that you consider, are you in regimes that the overlap, what, what, did you quantify the overlap between them? Because they're very non-local, right? So uh, I won't- I had, but... I, Sorry, uh, I didn't mathematically quantify it. Um, in, in the paper that I referenced, there's some pictures showing how the shape of the function actually compares to these, these profiles. Right. I guess that one could do, one could do just for fun, uh, a comparison of how much it would be if you were to cut off that, if you do a continuum theory, but cut off the profile, you get exactly the profile that you got, but just sharply cut it off in the overlap and then compare with what you have. And the difference kind of tells you what the overlap does. And I wonder why it was, because when there's overlap, it can shoot, you know, the, the, even if it's a small overlap, the, the harvesting, the correlations that you create in the overlap can be really high. Well, again, I think it's also about interpretation. The actual detectors that I put in, mm -hmm. um, they, they're point like, and they have a Gaussian switching function. So I believe that there may be overlap in the, in the switching, um, but that's, not too absurd, at least compared to other uh, papers that have considered that as well. But um, so if you if you were to cut off the pro cut it off where they overlap, you're going to be you're going to be modifying the band limit further. Yeah. yeah so I, I mean, because this band limit makes the detectors in a way interact a causally. Yeah. A little bit, and that in the sense that they couple to a kind of transmission of information instantaneously. So I wonder what the effect yeah. of that, quantifying that on the, if you were interested in space like harvesting, for example, mm -hmm. quantifying how much of that comes from the fact that you cut off the theory could be an interesting thing to quantify. Well, I think, I think you also made an interesting point about it being a causal. I mean, I think that's also probably because this band limit is, is not a covariant band limit. We've already picked a frame, so we've thrown out you know, covariance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly not coherent, but also it would introduce some amount of superluminal signaling that I yeah. think if, if we were talking about harvesting for the sake of space, like entanglement harvesting, it's a, it's a relevant question to quantify. I, I agree. All right. Uh, there weren't any more questions, but just in case we may have time for one more from somebody else. Okay, if there aren't any more, then let's thank Laura again. Thank you, Laura. Great talk. Thank you. All right, our next speaker today is Greg Kaplanek. Uh, so the, he's gonna talk about from uh, about hot qubits on the horizon, late times in rotational backgrounds, very interesting title. Floor is yours, Greg. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to the organizers and for listening to me today. So uh, uh, the topic of my uh, research is basically, in a sense, it's uh, the opposite of the small distance to topics we talked about today, it's, it's long distance physics, in particular late times, so uh, infrared issues. So it seems what happens is that um, for interacting field theories and gravitational backgrounds, when you do a naive perturbative expansion, what you, you, you seem to run into so-called secular late time divergences. And so my research is kind of focusing on ways in which we can resum these late time divergences. And so uh, we apply this to a qubit. Uh, and so the paper highlighted in red, that's uh, the one that this talk is most heavily based on. And that's research I've been working on with my supervisor, um, Cliff Burgess. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, so for the talk, so essentially I'll motivate what is this, uh, what, is the, what is the reason for having these late time breakdowns in perturbation theory? Um, and I'll introduce the concept of a late time resummation where we're not actually solving the whole theory. We're still perturbing in some small couplings, um, but we're allowed to ask access to much later times than we'd normally be able to with just an ordinary Dyson series. And uh, as a way of making this late time resummation, I'll propose that open quantum systems are useful tools and they seem to be particularly relevant for space times where there's horizons. Um, and uh, yeah, as I was saying, so I'll put, uh, 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 I'll put an under DeWitt detector in short shield space uh, and demonstrate how these open quantum systems tools work there uh, and show how these uh, robust late time inferences can be made here. So um, uh, so the story, the standard story in uh, quantum field theory and curved space time, we're very often just 
thinking about free fields living in gravitational backgrounds. And uh, so, and what we're in, in, implicitly assuming there basically is that we can always perturb in the couplings whenever there's some field interactions, whether with themselves or with other fields. And so, yeah, what I'm trying to say here is that we have to be cautious with this logic, that at least when we start to make, start to do calculations with interacting field theories. And the, the reason for this is basically that um, if we're perturbing about some free Hamiltonian uh, with some small coupling G, let's say, uh, morally what you're doing uh, is when you're ap applying evolution operators as an equation one, we're basically doing an expansion in powers of GT. Um, and so the observation to make here um, is that uh, no matter how small we make the coupling G, there always exists some time T for which uh, the terms that are supposed to be subleading start to blow up basically in your face. And so this is just a very generic observation about uh, Dyson series. And, um, and, and, and this kind of generically happens whenever you're doing a quantum calculation in some background. And so it's for this reason that gravity is not actually really uh, something special in, in the sense that we have these late time issues there. It's just that it, the fact that gravity is always there why we should be concerned about this. And so uh, there's a sense in which gravity acts as a medium or an environment. Um, and so, and uh, there, there is evidence of these secular divergences in the literature. So very simple one. Uh, so when you're doing an effective field theory in a gravitational background where there's a horizon and therefore a temperature. And so that's what the uh, 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 T capital T is supposed to be there. So if you look at, for example, the simplest correction to the propagator um, and you, uh, and you calculate what is its time dependence for the times on the external legs, you do find basically that at late times, you get this late time divergence when T minus T prime basically gets very large. Um, and that's not to say that we can't reliably make late time inferences, but uh, we do have to come up with some ways of resumming these uh, late time divergences. And so the simplest example of how one of these late time resummations work uh, is in the example of particle decays. So the uh, idea is we ask ourselves, uh, let's, let's, let's suppose we're calculating some decay rate and perturbation theory. So we're um, perturbing some coupling. Uh, and the question is, why do we trust uh, exponential decay laws as opposed to just a perturbative series in the, in the exponential decay law? And um, the reason is, is because basically when you, look at, when you look at these relations, what you find is that there's a uh, that we trust the evolution equation basically to, to, to much later times. And so the idea is that the evolution equation has a broader domain of validity. Um, uh, and, and this is and specifically because the uh, variable N only implicitly depends on T and there's not an explicit dependence on T. And so um, that's, and uh, we can derive such evolution equations from a perturbative series. Um, and and the, basically the argument that kind of goes something like this. So what uh, normally what happens is we can solve for some small window where perturbation theory applies. Uh, we can solve for the perturbative expression in terms of uh, its time dependence. But the, the fact is because this evolution equation, we can solve it basically in any time window we want since it's time local. And so we can solve it in some other window between T1 and T3, let's say, and some other perturbative expansion applies there. And we can really do this in whatever uh, window we like uh, along the entire time domain that we're considering. And the, the point is, is because we trust the tiny little bits of solutions across that whole time domain, we can kind of stitch them together. And it's in this sense that we can kind of uh, uh, infer that there's an exponential decay law that we can trust, uh, even though we're just perturbing in the coupling G when we're calculating the decay rate. So in principle, we could derive this from a perturbative series itself, um, these, these, these sorts of evolution equations. but um, what we're going to be looking for in this talk is uh, getting some sort of evolution equation handed to us, and that's going to be through these open quantum systems methods. And these are going to allow us for access to very late times. And so uh, just a side note before I move on is there are a couple of ways in which this argument might, might fail, although not necessarily so, uh, is if there's some complicated dependence um, on time in the right hand side of these evolution equations. And what's going to be most pertinent for later on in the talk is this uh, equation in red on the lower right. So that where there's a convolution with a time dependent decay rate, let's say. So, um, and the question in those situations is when can we make these time local so we can make this uh, late time argument. So uh, for gravity it turns out open quantum systems seem like a good tool to use. So um, kind of 
what is an open quantum system? I think most people in the audience will know, but uh, it's uh, we have some system where we have access to its degrees of freedoms. We can make measurements and calculate observables. And there's some environment we don't have access to. However, the two are still talking to each other. And uh, the idea here is we're going to uh, take the full density matrix that describes the full combined state, and we're gonna trace away the environment degrees of freedom and get some reduced density matrix for uh, the system that we can actually make measurements on. And what we're largely doing in open quantum systems is deriving uh, master equations. And uh, basically by the arguments I was making on the previous slide, when these master equations are Markovian, they allow us to access to very, very late times. And so they seem to be uh, very useful in this context. And so in this talk, what I'll be doing is I'll be deriving a master equation for a qubit where the qubit's gonna be the open system and the scalar field it's talking to, that's going to be uh, the environment. And so uh, just tying off the section, so uh, open, for the, the canonical example of an open quantum system is basically just a thermal system, um, as many people are, I'm sure, I'm sure know. And uh, what's, what's interesting in these types of settings is that energy is not necessarily conserved in just your system sector. So you can have particles and information getting exchanged between uh, the system and the environment. And as I was saying, when these equations are time local, uh, we can make these uh, robust late time uh, resummations essentially. And so why am I talking about open quantum systems? Well, the reason is basically whenever you have a space time with a horizon, they seem to strongly resemble open quantum systems uh, in the sense that we have our side of the horizon in which we have, ac we have access to its degrees of freedom and it's talking to some environment. And um, so uh, the kind of big picture goal of our research program is um, how can we use open quantum systems methods to make reliable late time inferences uh, for interacting field theories um, in these space times? And kind of the big goal is, are there open effective field theories that we can write down um, essentially? Uh, so, but uh, of course, field theories are very complicated. So the reason why I'm focusing on the Unruh the Witt detector here is it's got a, uh, a simple Hilbert space. So you can very clearly see how all these arguments work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the motivation uh, for considering the Unruh DeWitt detector in this case. Um, so uh, the setup I'll have in this problem is, so there's, uh, it's, which everyone's probably gonna be familiar with, there's a uh, qubit has some free Hamiltonian with some qubit gap uh, omega. Uh, as I said, we're gonna be in Schwarzschild space. I'll be working solely in Schwarzschild coordinates today. And uh, we put the qubit on some time-like trajectory which is parameterized by its proper time. Uh, and so uh, the choice of trajectory we'll make in this talk is uh, we'll let the qubit just hover just outside the event horizon. So uh, the two black dots, basically we can just take them and we'll put them as close as we can to the event horizon. Um, uh, and uh, the reason for doing that is basically uh, as, when, the closer we get to the event horizon, then uh, the geodesic separation be, be, between those two points gets very small. And what we'll find later on is uh, our correlation functions take a very simple form. So uh, just keeping that in the back of our heads, uh, the environment is our free scalar field, which we assume has some negligible mass. And uh, we build a Hamiltonian and the interaction Hamiltonian basically is uh, uh, the simplest one that's considered in the literature in, in the sense that there's no switching function. So the, uh, the, the interaction persists basically for infinitely long times. And we also assume, I guess, that the uh, detector is point-like uh, in this interaction. And so uh, as far as the state goes, so uh, the, the, the full state for the system, of course, will be some Louisville equation where L of T is a Louisvillean operator that I uh, will be useful later on in a few slides. Uh, this is the short form notation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus uh, on the state of the qubit only, of course, and uh, we'll make the standard assumption that there's a uh, uh, initial uncorrelated condition uh, for the combined system. So we'll assume that the qubit is in some arbitrary initial state and the field is in a so-called Hadamard vacuum state. So this is uh, Hadamard type vacua are generic types of vacuum states uh, that live on uh, curved space times. And uh, they, we, th we think they're physically reasonable ones because they mimic basically the singularity structure of correlations in flat space. And in them, they've got inbuilt uh, notions of the equivalence principle and so on. So um, there's very different, there's many different types of uh, Hadamard vacua. And so in Schwarzschild space, uh, examples of Hadamard type vacua are the Unruh state or the Hartle-Hawking state. 
Um, so we're not going to specify which one we're picking. We're just going to assume the state is Hadamard. And so because of what I was saying on the earlier slides that when the uh, qubits uh, trajectory is very, very close to the horizon, these correlations really simplify drastically because we're only really seeing the singularity. And uh, I don't really have time to get into the way that calculation works here, but what you find at the end of the day is um, the Whiteman function essentially becomes very simple. Uh, it basically is uh, some function W tilde, which is suppressed by some redshift factors. And many people will recognize equation 15 as uh, basically uh, 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 the correlations in flat space for a uniformly accelerated observer, um, basically with the replacement of A going to one over two A, I believe. And so, uh, and we have basically parametric control over when this is, uh, uh, when we, when these correlations have this form. So uh, basically when uh, T over RS is much less than log of one minus RS over R naught, basically we can, by taking R naught close to RS, we can basically stretch that time out to as far as we'd like. And uh, so we, by just basically assuming that that's as large as we'd like, we can use this, uh, uh, these correlations. Um, uh, in, in the following uh, uh, arguments. So uh, I haven't really talked about the open quantum systems treatments yet. So uh, what we're gonna be using is like what's the, called the nakajima zwanzig equation. So the basic idea is let's trace the Louisville equation over the environment degrees of freedom in a way that uh, we have only an equation that refers to the qubits that density matrix. And it turns out this, is, this can be done. Nakajima and Zwanzig did this back in the 60s. And uh, basically it's some complicated form in, the, in that there's this, on the right-hand side of the evolution equation, there's a, uh, some, a kernel operator, which depends on the interaction you've chosen. And there's a integral over the history basically of the qubit state. So we, we have some convolutions basically appearing here. And so what's, what's important here is that this equation is non-local in, non -local in time. And uh, so this history dependence is often called memory effects. And what I wanted to underline is uh, although, it has a diff although it has a different name here, it really is just the Louisville equation. It's just packaged in such a way that we see only the qubits, uh, the qubit state. And uh, because of the arguments I was making earlier, uh, because it's, of an, it's an evolution equation, we're going to try and take a limit where uh, this becomes time local and we can get access to later times than we'd normally be able to uh, through perturbation theory. So, uh, and, and of course, uh, we can actually still perturb this uh, kernel operator in the coupling G. And uh, when you do that calculation, what you find is you get independent equations for the diagonal components and the off diagonal components. And um, uh, so what you find to leading order in the coupling is an evolution equation for the diagonal equation. I won't talk about the off diagonal one here. Uh, and so this evolution equation just depends on the function W tilde I wrote on the other slide. And so it depends on W tilde when we start to track uh, the qubit state in terms of the Schwarzschild time T. And so uh, that's why these redshift factors aren't appearing in this expression. And uh, basically after uh, uh, this also introduces a redshift factor in the qubit gap. So I've defined this redshifted qubit gap, which this uh, equation is depending on. And so picking apart uh, this equation, the first term is, uh, basically the standard transition rate that one finds uh, for, uh, for unruh DeWitt detectors. And the second term, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's slightly less uh, recognizable because there's a dependence on T minus S basically in the qubit state. So this has this convolution structure I was- Five minutes, five minutes. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry Greg. <laughs> that's good. Uh, so there's this convolution structure that's appearing here. And what we'd like to do is ask, when does this become time local? because at, the, at least at face value, it doesn't seem like we can get to late times using this expression. So, um, uh, so yeah, what is it time local? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a Markovian approximation here. So what we have to do here is assume that uh, uh, basically the qubit state varies much slower than the correlation time in the bath. Uh, and when we do this, basically we can apply a Taylor series about S equals zero in the earlier equation. So when we do this, we just keep the leading order term in the Markovian approximation, and we get a very simple equation. Basically, you can then, by assuming that the times are much greater than uh, RS, we can take the limits on the integrals to infinity, and we can evaluate the integrals, and they have very simple form. 
uh, and many people will recognize uh, equation 21 as uh, the acceleration, the, the, the transition rate for an uh, accelerated qubit in, in Kosky space. And uh, Candelis found this expression in the 80s uh, in Schwarzschild space. So uh, we're agreeing with that here. And because this equation is time local, we are now basically able to uh, get access to very late times. So when you solve this, what you find is this equation basically asymptotes to R over 2C. And uh, when you look at the, the functional form of these functions, basically you do a, a short calculation, you find that R over 2C is just a Fermi Dirac distribution, uh, which follows uh, basically from detailed balance. And uh, you find uh, basically a solution that's valid to all orders in G squared T, uh, which relaxes to this Fermi Dirac distribution with some time scale that I've called C, C here, uh, which is basically one over two G squared C. And what's interesting about this expression is if you uh, expand about G squared uh, CT, then you basically retrieve what you would find using an ordinary Dyson series. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting connection because you can see uh, that the Dyson series is telling us the correct behavior kind of as it's leaving the initial state. And then there's some time basically where the perturbative uh, description breaks down, which is when T becomes basically order one over G squared. Um, so uh, yes, the solution uh, for the off diagonal uh, components, um, they, it, it goes through very similar, although it's slightly more complicated, uh, but at the end of the day, they go to zero. And, and so the state decoheres and you find uh, unsurprisingly that the late time state for the qubit is thermal. So you, you get exactly, that you basically expen exponentiate the um, you exponentiate the cube is free Hamiltonian with a local Hawking temperature, and this is the state that you find here. Um, and so, uh, and then uh, coming to the end now, basically, there's a regime where this Taylor expansion that I was talking about, where that expansion is valid, and when it's not. And so, when it turns out, when you uh, bound these subleading terms in the Taylor series, and you look at what that means for the parameters in the problem, you, you find that basically you're restricted to the case where the redshift of cubic gap is very small compared to the temperature, which is why the talk is called hot qubits on the horizon. And uh, what's interesting here is that um, because it's the redshifted cubic gap that appears here, um, you, you basically were guaranteed to satisfy this for any reasonable values of omega. So. Um, so the kind of the punchline here is that we have a universal behavior for a near horizon qubit. So for any Hadamard vacuum state at all, um, we find that there's, for this uh, trajectory we chose, that there's Markovian behavior and we have these universal relaxation time scales that appear. So uh, when you look at the functional forms for C that I had on the earlier slides and you take the small omega limit of them, basically you find these time scales go like RS over G squared. Um, so uh, yeah, to conclude, um, late times are when you're doing perturbation theory in, in gravitational backgrounds, um, it's, it's possible that you can run into issues um, with these secular divergences, although we need not despair because there are, of course, methods for resummation that exist, which uh, people have known about for a long time. And, um, and it seems that they, uh, in particular, that open quantum systems methods are very useful whenever there's a horizon in your gravitational background. And so this is, and what's interesting about these so-called open effective field theories is they're non-Wilsonian in nature because of this fact that the system sector does not conserve energy in and of itself. So it seems like there's a very different rule set of rules for open effective field theories. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, and that's kind of where uh, we'd like to explore more of these ideas is for some uh, interacting field theories uh, eventually. So yeah, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. A nice talk. Questions? We have a first hand from Rob. Rob, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Greg. Uh, can you go back a couple of slides, please? Sure. About 18, I think, maybe. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe 19. I'm trying to remember. Maybe it was 19. Yeah, you get this these results here at 18 and 19. Now, are they valid only when uh, one minus RS over R naught is small? Because earlier you made an approximation like that. Is that still necessary? Yes. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yes. So um, we're here like 
definitely so constrained. So this is close to the horizon. Yes, yeah. So it's a very kind of uh, finesse limit in a way. It's a, you, we're not really able to learn much about any other parts of the of the space time. Uh, but so we're, yeah, we're definitely constrained to that here. How do you think you could go about getting out of that? Like, I mean, you did it. If I uh, wait, like, I don't know, halfway through, I think it made the Whiteman function look nice or easily approximable. Yeah. But what if you don't do it and just do it numerically? I mean, is that feasible? I, I, I think it's feasible. I mean, there, there's what's, what's going to, you're going to then eventually have to make a choice for what vacuum state you're in. And so that we avoided doing here also in a way, but so I, I think it's feasible for sure, but it's, I guess the Whiteman function is some, you know, some, some very big mode sum. And uh, I think people have attempted this in the literature. Um, and it's very I'm hard to get I'm fully aware like a, of the agony of mode sums. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But you could try <laughs> this same thing in, in like one lower dimension or something where the, you can get away from doing that. Right, right. A BTZ black hole or something. Right. I, I have. We we have not considered that, and yeah, that's definitely something to to think about. You Thank seem you. to have. Anyway, it's something to consider. Right. The mode sum is painful. Yeah. yeah. The mode sum is painful, but but I think if you go to lower dimension, you can maybe get some insight as to what you know, getting away from the horizon. I mean, eventually, it, it they have to be faced, but. You can right. go a long way if you go to that scenario. So, okay, right. thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rob. We have a quick question from Albert. Uh, Albert, Albert, yours. Yes. <laughs> thanks. Uh, it's nice talk. So, just just really a, a, a follow up uh, to Rob's uh, remarks, namely, you know, basically what uh, this is really it's just what you said hot. So it's really the hot the hot temperature uh, the high temperature limit. Where you know, in many cases, uh, you know that when you couple your system to a bath in the high, in the high temperature limit, you recover. It's not an unexpected that you have a Markovian uh, behavior, but when you go right. to lower temperatures, that is no longer the case. There are no Markovian effects, certainly for when you don't consider the long time limit. Uh, so, in that respect, yes, I, I think as what Rob was suggesting would be interesting because basically you would be then exploring the lower temperature case where. Right. You know, more interesting non Markovian effects might arise. And so you might actually then see more interestingly this transition between Markovian and non Markovian regime, perhaps. I mean, those certainly arise for finite times. Long time right. limits is a little bit different, but still, I mean, you might be able to see when your approximation for your master equation or UV equation kind of breaks down uh, the Markovian right. equation in, at low temperatures. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something we thought about a bit. Um, in uh, simpler space time. So we did uh, a calculation into sitter space where we tried to account for some small amount of non-Markovian effects. And it, yeah, it seems, uh, uh, of course, as, as you kind of alluded to, it's a, it's a much more difficult problem, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Um, kind of where we're coming from in a way though, is uh, because we're trying to write down effective field theories kind of for interacting systems, the kind of the first place we're looking is the Markovian limit. So, and fields basically can be Markovian as well, we're finding. And so uh, there we're kind of looking first where, this, where the simplest possible place is uh, in a sense. So that's kind of partially what motivated us here also to look there. Um, but yeah, um, non-Markovian behavior is definitely, I think more, much more rich and yeah, it'd be very interesting to explore more. Right, because that now that you brought up the bigger, the broader picture of uh, you know fields and so on, typically you would expect that when you have uh, light fields or massless fields, you are going to have you know longer range correlations, and so Markovian approximations or local approximations will in general not be valid unless right. you look at very specific situations like what you were exactly looking here, for example. Right, right, and that's actually why. We could have, first we kind of started what's just the Markovian approximation, but this is why we actually went back to this nakajima Swanson equation. What's, what's nice about that is it gives you a starting point where you're really, you know you're starting with the kosher Louisville equation and you're, you basically then by tracking what approximations you're making by getting to the Markovian limit, you can very carefully analyze where, what regime of parameter space you're in. And so it's, it's that limit where that's, it's from that angle that we're trying to do this field theory calculations of the Markovian limit now is trying to 
see like wh where what region of parameter space is that Markovian, and it seems to be a very very small region of parameter space. But um, yeah, yeah. So I agree completely that the approach that you took that, that you took was very nice in that respect, trying to do things in a control manner and showing very nicely how you know uh, the Markovian approximation or what it gives rise to and under what conditions it's valid. So I agree that that was a very very nice approach, which can be done you know relatively easily and in a clean manner in this in this example yeah all right uh, thank you the next hand that i see is jorma hello very nice uh, could you go to equation 21 sure uh-huh yes okay so uh the real part there uh, looks unexpected uh, can uh. you remind us where it came from I, I apologize, that is a typo. It's, it's, it's just uh, W, sorry about that. Uh, what about 22? Uh, 22, it is the real part. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it really is just the classic uh, uh, transition rate. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jorma. I have a couple of questions. Uh, of, uh, one was going to be that. <laughs> I <was possibly> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, so, so this is this is nice. So let me try to get me to this. Is nice because what you're doing here is uh, kind of different from other things that I've read before regarding uh, master equations for underway detectors. Here, in the case, in this case, you have full unitary evolution for the field detector system. But then you have an effective master equation that will effective. You have a master equation for the detector, right? Because of course the detector is not evolving unitarily one interacting with the field. That's really nice. And analyzing in what regimes uh, you can do Markovian approximations. So there was something that Albert mentioned, and I'm not, I'm not so intuitively, I would expect. So you have a massless field, for example. Intuitively, I would expect the thing, uh, the response of the detector to be pretty uh, Markovian in a way. And the reason being that uh, the detector moves in a time-like trajectory. So the information that the detector dumps on the field, in a way, is not going to cross paths with the detector anymore <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's propagating faster than the detector, right? It's going on no trajectories. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, though, that if you have some mass scales, you're going to start breaking down. You're going to get some normal Markovian effects because you do something to the field and that something lingers and the detector can overtake it. And there will mm -hmm. be some memory there, right? Uh, so I, I, is that intuition? misguided or this is very a very naive way of, of looking at it but it makes sense to me that in a massless field you would get more degree of markovianity because of that I, I, go ahead i'm not entirely sure but i, th I think you're right so uh we we studied a, a example of the uniformly accelerated trajectory in just flat minkowski space and we tracked the mass there mm -hmm. and we found there was a markovian limit but i think you're right in the sense that when you looked at the regions of parameter space where that the Markovian approximation was valid, it seemed to be a much smaller regime, basically. So I, I guess you're right in that way, although I don't have a super clear statement as to why that's that's kind of all, all the intuition I can give. Um, I'm just going intuition wise, I'm going by you dump a perturbation on the field. And if, if that perturbation escapes the detector trajectory, it doesn't cross paths with it, certainly it's not going to affect the dynamics of the detector. That's the kind of if I may add in, uh, I'm not sure it's that simple. In fact, my remark about massless fields was more in the opposite direction, namely the correlations. Yeah, I remember the correlations. Right. Correlation so scale. Yeah. Suppose that you don't consider this very particular case that where he has this uh, static detector very close to um, very close to the horizon, so that really he's probing then, as he mentioned, you know, correlation functions that are very close, and then they, they probe basically the, the deep. Uh, the UV region where or where you have this universal behavior of the of the detector and so on. But but if you just consider some simpler trajectory in some curved space time that it's not very curved and, and you have some arbitrary time like direction but not very accelerated, then you expect that the correlation exactly what you were saying, the correlation functions for your field, if if they, if it's very massive, then they will, you know, they will have a very short correlation or time uh, uh, correlation distance or time scale. And, and you can approximate things basically locally. Uh, and so I would expect that in fact, in, in for the massless case in general, you won't always be able to do that. But for sufficiently uh, massive fields, basically if uh, you, know, you look at time scales, which are longer than the inverse of the Compton frequency, for example, and things like that, 
naively one would expect, unless you look at extreme situations like here, uh, if, if your curvature uh, scale and you know the characteristic uh, scale corresponding to the acceleration and so on are, are, are small compared to that, then I, I would expect that uh, it's in, in the opposite direction somehow, that for massless fields, you might in general expect to have non-local effects and non-Markovian effects. Uh, I, think, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I think there would be maybe two competitions here. One is, of course, you get uh, you have correlations in the field that if you have got a massive field, they're going to be exponentially suppressed with the mass scale. If it's a, a mass zero, it's polynomially suppressed only. So I, I see that that's going to affect Markovianity. But at the same time, there's also another source of non-Markovianity, right? Which is what I was mentioning: a detector right. that can fly faster than the perturbations that he's putting on the field can intercept those perturbations, right? So. You're right. Well, in a sense, the, 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 the limit where what I was saying would be probably more or less kind of safe would be the limit of high masses where also uh, the, the, the excitations of the field are also adiabatically suppressed. So basically right. what I was saying is that if this mass scale of the field is larger than all your, all your other relevant scales, for example, and that includes also the curvature and the scale associated with the acceleration of your detector, then you would generically expect that probably some kind of local approximation or Markovian approximation might right. work. Uh, but otherwise, it's even for massive fields, of course, that's, that's not guaranteed to be the case. Right. So but somehow you expect that generically for massless fields, uh, it's not, it's not you know, generically you expect non Markovian effects because of the you know, longer range correlations. Right. So, so, so just one last phrase before, because I see hand, hand by German. Uh, the, the, there would be, that means also that it's not just uh, dependent on regime, it would be trajectory dependent too. So if you try to do it, if you try to do this Markovian approximation, depending on what time the trajectory you have. Absolutely, absolutely. Suppose, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're high, if your uh, unroot temperature, it turns out to be, if the acceleration is higher and your unroot temperature is higher than the mass of uh, your field, right. you know, you go from basically being able to neglect the unroot effect to becoming relevant. So, right. yes, absolutely. Right, uh, we have a hand by uh, Jorma. Sorry, Jorma, I saw your hand uh, pretty late. <laughs> Sorry about that. I go back to 20, equation 22 again. So uh, this is maybe a notational question uh, about the way this integral over S is written. So W is a distribution. It has a non-integrable distributional singularity at S equals zero. Um, and, and you're writing the formula so that it integration starts at uh, s equals zero. Is this shorthand for something that's actually mathematically well defined? Uh, I, I, I mean, so the, the thing I can say is the real part of the Whiteman function is symmetric about s equals zero, as is the cosine function. So basically, you can the factor of two, you can just convert this since the function is symmetric overall. You could just convert that into an integral from minus infinity to infinity. So that's kind of the way, the trick I use to make this integral make sense. Um, but I have, in, for example, in the uh, off-diagonal equation, so I kind of swept this on the rug here in this talk, but there, there's another function that appears there where there's a, uh, you do an integral over the real part of the Whiteman, Whiteman function and a sine of, of omega s. And there you can't make this, do this trick. And then you actually, as you say, you, you hit a singularity basically because of this, and we have to parameterize this in a certain way. So what this ends up doing is renormalizing the qubit frequency in that, in that uh, part of the paper. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of a trick. I don't really have a, a better way of explaining it other than that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a generic. So, so uh, should I take 22 at face value or is there some renormalization hidden under yeah, even uh, in the paper. I I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I mean I, W. I it's like one over s squared, a small s. Yeah, yeah. I guess. I, I guess I guess it's like the the Hadamard real part. I guess and you could think of it in a certain way because in the limit of the, that you take the i epsilon to zero. I think I think it might be well defined in that sense. Yeah, but, I, um, I think so. I mean, basically, it's what you said that you can rewrite it just as the Fourier transform of the real part, and so then uh, it's just the Fourier transform, which is, you know, it, in general, it will be a relation for uh, distributions, but it's well defined somehow in, in frequency space. In fact, sometimes you actually—that's one way of uh, getting correctly the uh, distributional 
uh, real part, for example, or also the, the imaginary part of your Weinman function coming from Fourier space. Um, so in this case, you are kind of transform. It's not exactly that, but kind of transforming back from Fourier space. So, um, right. But it's it's really a Fourier transform. So uh, if your uh, Weinman function is a well-defined distribution, it's really a, a, a Fourier transform of a well-defined distribution. So in general, it will be a well-defined distribution. But in fact, uh, it it might even have better behavior than the Weinman function itself. On the other hand, what, what Greg said is absolutely correct. So typically on, on all these examples, what you see is that this which is connected to the symmetric part of the Hallmark function or more generically the so-called noise kernel and is connected to the diffusion part of your master equation or that also related to decoherence. This is typically, you know, uh, okay. And instead the part that is connected with the, what is sometimes called the dissipation kernel, which is related to your rate here that's where you typically do need a, a, a renormalization. And if you want to actually express that in terms of what we were saying, distributions and so on, is because it turns out that there what you have, in one case, it would be the symmetric part of uh, your Weidman function. And that's a well-defined distribution. The commutator uh, is also a well-defined distribution, but it turns out that the way it enters actually in your equations for the dynamics of your open quantum system, they are causal. And so what enters is really the product of the, the commutator times a theta function in time that gives the actually the causal behavior. And the point is that while the commutator is in general a well-defined distribution, uh, the product of the commutator times a theta function, that is in general not a well-defined distribution. <coughs> that would be the mathematical uh, reason behind the need for renormalization. And you can see, you know, that how the two are related. But if you are thinking in terms of um, distributions, that's actually the reason that the, the, your Weidmann function or even more complicated structures, the noise kernel and dissipation kernel, both of them are well-defined. One corresponds to uh, anti-commutator, the other to a commutator. Those are well-defined distributions. But what actually enters in the dynamics is a product of the dissipation kernel times a theta function that gives the causal nature that you expect to your, and, and that's where in general you will have, mathematically will not be well-defined. Physically it does correspond to the fact that typically you will have some uh, renormalization. And if you have a cutoff, you're really, you know, this, the typical thing with the bare parameters, what you just said, the renormalization of the frequency of your qubit and things like that. Interesting. I've never heard that before. That's very interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Albert and uh, Jorma. Thank you very much, Greg. Greg, thank you again. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, really, really enjoyable talk. I'm going to start the recording. All right. The last speaker of the session is Ahmed Shalabi uh, from the University of Waterloo. And he's going to talk about band-limited and Ruby detectors, uh, detector dynamics on two plus one flat and spherical spacetime. So, Ahmed, whenever you want, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the um, organizers and the participants for all the great talks so far. Um, I'm a master's student at the University of Waterloo, and I'm here to present um, this work under the supervision slash uh, collaboration with Dr. Robert Mann and Dr. Laura Henderson. So um, a lot of this work is uh, sort of a natural extension to um, the, uh, the earlier talk that Laura gave about band limits in QFT or entanglement harvesting. So I'll just give a quick rundown of the motivations for this work just for all on the same page. So one of the uh, biggest open questions in physics is what happens at small length scales. We've seen in the previous talk that there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between a finite length and certainty and the band-limited QFT. In, uh, in this work, um, we are going to analyze what happens on a spherical spacetime. And the motivation for that is twofold. First, uh, once um, if we're talking about the notion of a band limit, a space that is bounded on and compact will have um, any field on it would have countably infinite field modes. So the notion of a band limit or a cutoff perhaps kind of falls off naturally from this consideration. Another thing is that two plus one ADS is conformal to half of Einstein's static universe, which is just 
S2, so a sphere, uh, cross R. So in this work, we will follow the conventional approach as well, similar to uh, the previous work. We will use delta switching to couple underdoit detectors as uh, to, to a scalar field, in particular a vacuum. And uh, we'll use this setup as um, where the detectors are based, they locally sample the fields, they're local proxies of, of the field. Um, one last remark, many switches exist uh, in the uh, in the study of entanglement harvesting, we are going to uh, focus on delta switching in primarily because it allows us to solve for the detector dynamics uh, number two. So I'd like to begin with a general overview of delta switching and uh, what or or how to go about realizing it or generalizing it to a to a curved space time. So we'll follow the analysis by uh, Peter and Wardo, where they presented the, the no-go theorem for delta switching entanglement harvesting, which basically states that no entanglement can be harvested for uh, two from two detectors uh, of arbitrary spatial separation or position from the, the vacuum or any coherent state of a field. So we will begin with a joint state of two under do with detectors in their uh, in the ground state and the scalar field in its vacuum state. The interaction Hamiltonian is given by this lambda is the coupling constant, chi is the switching function. The sigma d's are the SC2 ladder operators for detectors um, A and B. Uh, FD is the shape function or the spatial profile of a given detector, and phi is our scalar field. So oh, sorry. So by using the, uh, the switching function, um, or by using delta switching, we can rewrite the time evolution operator as uh, such, where these yas and ybs are the smear, the smear field operators, and they're given um, as such. And then using... Um, using uh, the uh, Taylor series expansion of the exponential, the fact that um, the SC2 ladder operator is squared to one, we can rewrite the time evolution operator in terms of these um, X operators are basically just exponentials of the smeared field operators. So given this form of the, um, of the, um, time evolution operator, we can rewrite or we can write the final state of the, um, the, the two detectors by tracing out the um, vacuum or the field degree of freedom. And this trace includes expressions, which are basically expectation values of these uh, X operators with regards to the scalar field. So what these, uh, so the indices J, K, L, and M can can be plus one or minus one. And they basically define uh, the state uh, or the, the density operator row AB. This expression evaluates to um, this expression right here. And we notice that it depends on um, these FAs and FBs and these thetas. And what those expressions are, the FBs are um, expectation values of the exponential of the smeared field operator and theta is uh, a smeared field, the, the commutator of the smear, smeared field. And then um, once, once we evaluate these, we, we trace out detectors A and B individually and we end up with these, with these expressions where the um, transition probabilities will be given by uh, these terms over here. So the fundamental idea here is we haven't made any mention to the background space time. Given some field that can be expressed somehow, what we need to realize or what we need to establish is what the smear field operator would look like. And from it, what these functions, the FDs and the and field commutators would look like. So for any globally hyperbolic um, background space time, we can solve the Klein-Gordon equation for the uh, for the field modes, and then expand the scalar field in terms of these 
in terms of these modes. So, so on the sphere, we began by starting from the, uh, the S2 metric. The, uh, the modes of the, of, of, or, or the solution of the glide coordinate equation for this given metric are given by these. We've obtained these from this paper by Lipschitz and Ortiz. So given these modes, we can expand the scalar field in these ALM and ALM dagger uh, creation and annihilation operators. And basically what those operators do that they raise and lower the, uh, the angular momentum of the, of the scalar field. So um, expanding the, the, the smear field operator in terms, uh, so we're integrating over S2, we've um, expressed the field, the scalar field in terms of this expansion. Um, and we, re we will rewrite the, the spatial profile in terms of the uh, spherical harmonics such that we can use the orthogonality of the spherical harmonics and splitting those two terms into um, a term and a, and a conjugate term, we can rewrite the, the, the field operator uh, as such. It's interesting to note that this, exp this expression or this expansion can be written as that. Um, and what this expansion here allows us to do, it allows us to calculate what FB is. So recall that FD was just an X, was the exponential of the smeared field operator and then the expectation value of that. Using this uh, expansion, we can see that FD is just going to evaluate to uh, the exponential of negative a half of the sum of these coefficients alpha ALM in the um, smeared field operator. And uh, the field uh, or uh, commutator theta evaluates to this, where the FLM A's and B's are the spherical harmonics uh, coefficients and the time uppercase T is the time difference between the switches of detector one and detector two. And then we can plug in what FD and theta are to give us the transition probability of our detectors in um, on the sphere in this case, on the spherical space time. Um, it is interesting, or it's worth noting that these coefficients would, uh, or the, yeah, the spherical harmonics coefficients would encode basically the shapes, the sizes, and the spatial separations, right? So this expression is very general, and we would need to particularize these two expressions depending on the geometry of the detectors that we're going to use. So um, let's discuss the setup. So we'll use, uh, we'll study um, both two plus one flat and um, spherical space times. In flat space, we'll use Gaussian detectors, but we'll also use elliptical Gaussian detectors. So the idea that Gaussian detectors are, um, they're azimuthally symmetric, but we were curious about what happens if we kind of um, introduce an extra length scale so this extra length scale is introduced in terms of this epsilon, which is the ellipticity of the, the detector. And basically what we've done is instead of having um, basically a, a circle in the argument of the exponential and the Gaussian, we started with an ellipse in, and, and this expression is written in polar coordinates where, um, so AD would be either the width of the detector or the semi-minor axis if the detector is uh, squeezed or elliptical, and the ellipticity is bound between zero and one. So what about this, uh, the spherical space time? So there we'll use the fischer bingham uh, five-parameter distribution, which is a spherical equivalent of the Euclidean Gaussian distribution. The probability density function of this is given by this expression here. These, uh, this C is a normalization constant, these mu's and a's are uh, vectors that define the uh, the uh, where the semi-major, semi-minor, and center of the distributions are um, uh, localized or placed. So the parameters kappa and beta quantify the 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 size and the ellipticity of the distribution. So 
kappa is greater than or equal to zero, and it quantifies the spatial concentration on the center. So the bigger the kappa, the more concentrated the distribution is. And then beta quantifies the ellipticity, and it's bound by kappa over two. So the greater the the uh, greater the, the value of beta, the more elliptical that distribution is. So and, and these are just um, basically recreations of what the distributions would look like here. Uh, but before we get to that, so if we fix the, the first detector at the North Pole, then we can um, specify what the mu's and the a's are, such that if the detector is unsqueezed, right, so, or we'll refer to it as regular, where beta is equal to zero, the, the profile uh, reduces to this expression. And if it is squeezed in general, it, uh, it reduces to that. But the, the idea here is that we have picked a particular um, position, right? And that is the North Pole, and we're squeezing along the y-axis. Um, and then, as you can see, for example, this, for a cap is equal to 100, this is a visualization of what, uh, of what the detectors would look like. And for a maximally squeezed, detector, this is what it actually looks like. Um, since we'll be talking about band limits, it's it's important to note that the band limit in this case would correspond to a maximum cutoff of the, of the maximum L modes that the detector can uh, can couple to in, when it comes to, or in terms of the, um, the field expansion. So what about the second detector? So on a sphere, uh, the most natural thing is to localize it by by rotating the second detector relative to the first detector. So we'll use the, the three Euler angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, which will correspond to a uh, um, polar rotation theta from the, uh, from the North Pole, uh, uh, an azimuthal rotation phi, and uh, a, a rotation gamma of the detector around, of the second detector in this case, around its, um, a counterclockwise rotation around a center of mass. So the problem here is that we would need to calculate the FB5 distribution centered at each point on the sphere. And we would need to find, for every single point, we would need to derive expressions for what the spherical harmonics coefficients would be. But the, the more sensible thing to do is, is, since we're already interested in spherical harmonics coefficients of the, of the detectors, or so that we can study the response, we can actually transform the spherical harmonics coefficient through the um, through a Wigner D or through a rotation by the Wigner D matrix. And what the, the Wigner D matrices are, they're basically um, representation. So it's a representation of the rotation operator in the L and M basis. And given that, it's it's not hard to 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 derive how. Um, for example, if this is detector B, the modes for it can be described in terms of a rotation times the, the modes of the uh, of detector A. Um, or relative, so the, the, the angles are relative to detector A. So um, just one last thing, uh, since we've established that we need, uh, or the response depends on the spherical harmonics coefficients. Uh, we have found that these are the expressions for a regular or an unsqueezed Gaussian detector. Um, this was derived using um, a clever expansion for uh, like the exponential of kappa cos theta from this paper, and then the properties of uh, spherical harmonics. This expression um, is, these are uh, Bessel functions of the, uh, modified Bessel functions of the first kind here and here. And this expression we evaluate numerically moving forward in all the results. So finally, we have, um, we can now particularize the, the, the expressions that we've derived for FD and theta, given our um, Gaussian detectors on a sphere, and we encode the relative position of the second detector through the, the three Euler angles that um, that we 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 use as input to the Wigner D matrices to arbitrarily um, rotate and localize the second detector. The shape, size, and squeezing 
are encoded in the, the GLMs themselves for detectors A and B. And then right here, the T is the, the time or the time difference between the switches. So uh, we'll begin with reviewing flat space results really quickly so that we can compare and contrast to uh, what happens on a sphere. So the, um, we, we, we discovered that there exists an optimal uh, detector size to detect the band limit in flat space. And- uh, Five minutes of it. Thank you. Um, and that smaller detectors couple more strongly. We can see how, um, or how this optical, uh, how, how this optimal size was, uh, we can pinpoint it by seeing that the detectors around this region are more sensitive than you would expect to, or so they're, they're more sensitive to the band limit given any um, arbitrary tolerance. Uh, we've also seen that squeezing increases the response of the detectors in general, um, but it reduces the capability of detection around the optimal size. So this is the, uh, the optimal size that we established in the previous slide. And for a given tolerance, we see that um, basically don't see the peaks anymore. It, 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 it even reduces as you increase um, the squeezing or the ellipticity, the, 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 the sensitivity to the band limit decreases. However, we see that uh, for non-optimal sizes, but we haven't looked at every, like uh, the, the, the variable space of all possible sizes, we see that uh, squeezing actually improves the band limit detection of, the, of, of, of uh, those detectors. On a sphere, so uh, on here, uh, so here we're looking at the size versus the response of, uh, sorry, these two BPAs. So for one detector, the detector A, in terms of different L max values. And we see, um, and um, just a quick reminder, the bigger the cap, but the more concentrated the detector, i.e. the smaller. So. Um, we have seen evidence for potentially an optimal size for band limit detection in the point length limit. So on the right hand side, um, if we define uh, zeta to be one of our kappa, we see for very high uh, uh, Lmax, we see that there could be an, uh, uh, um, an optimal size here. But the problem is that this is on the order of magnitude of 10 to the five, 10 to the six kappa. And um, we also see that the squeezing does not decrease the response of the detectors contrary to what we see in flat space. Um, with regards to the band limit detection, if, if there exists an optimal size in the, then it probably exists in the point, in the, in the point light limit and Squeezing in the point line limit would, would not contribute anything because um, that extra length scale would just disappear. Okay, so what about two detectors? So on, on the sphere, so we, we initialize, um, so we rotate this, the second detector, the two detectors are regular, so it doesn't matter where we, we uh, or what phi we place the second detector. And we look at, um, initializing the detector at theta, at different thetas. And we will set the time switch or the time difference to equal the spatial separation, sorry. Um, so we see basically the same patterns for, uh, for example, like an arbitrary point where we, we, we set the, the second detector at the equator where the response, um, um, the bigger the the bigger the kappa, either smaller the detector, the the more strongly it couples to the field. So you would require more and more um, L max uh, to reach convergence. I.e., we see that smaller detectors are still better at detecting the band limit. However, if the detector is placed at the pole, this is where it gets really interesting. So first, we see that the response does not actually diverge at the pole, which is um, which is a good sign. But however, a couple of uh, interesting features. First, that the for medium-sized detectors, the response goes well beyond. So we, we, we're seeing responses greater than 0.8. Uh, 
which is greater than the, the, the flat space limit of half. Uh, and we also see this oscillatory behavior, right, uh, at around one half, which we are not, um, since this is a work in progress, some of uh, the aspects of this work are a work in progress, we still don't understand why. It's also worth noting that um, the sensitivity of LMAX for the detector increases once it's placed at the pole. Now, we, um, we look at another thing, which is um, if we can look at the field dynamics and see what, they, what we can learn from them using two detectors. So the idea here would be if the, if the second underdoit detector um, is, um, if it's localized anywhere, then the transition probability of it could be used as a local proxy for the field if the field around it is excited. Delta switching is non-perturbative, so back reaction is allowed, and we're actually justified or motivated to do this because the second detector interacts with an evolved state of the field. For two regular detectors, there's no phi dependence. So in, in, in these units, we can study what happens to the, the, to the field over the space time by looking at the response of the second detector as a function of theta and t. Um, so I might just say, so you know, yep. the time is over, but you can bite into the question time. Yes, just keep you. in mind that the more you continue, the, the fewer questions you get. Okay, yes, thank you, sorry about that. Um, so we basically, so we've done this here and we see that detectors, so if the first detector couples to the field, it locally excites it, and then we see a peak or a signal that travels down the space the space time with uh, with the peak around the light cone where theta is equal to t. We've seen that the signal is stronger around the poles. We've um, we've also seen that um, this particular this very interesting feature where the signal does not dissipate, so it bounces back and forth between the poles. But the idea here is that this signal is not too pi periodic; it's actually pi periodic. So we, we, um, we basically, uh, um, we see the signal instead of reaching the pole and bouncing back, we see it as if it runs backwards in time, which is also something that we, we still haven't fully understood yet. And it could be related to what happens for the, the second detector at the pole. Uh, finally, I'll just go through this quickly. Can squeeze detectors tell us more? So, We've initialized the detectors in four uh, different orientations. And in the middle, we look at the response in flat space. At, um, and at the, at the right, we, we look at the response in, in, on the sphere. And you know, there are several key interesting features that I'll just highlight really quickly, that the structure of the, of the signal of the light cone changes if you introduce squeezing. And orientations can change whether it is better to switch earlier or later. I.e., we've seen for two regular detectors that the, the peak of the signal would be along the light cone. So it's better to, for the maximum response, it's better to line up theta with T. But here it's not as this is not the case. We've also seen that the signal could be amplified or dampened depending on the orientations of detectors A and B relative to each other. We've seen that the, uh, on the spherical space time, the orientation of the detectors has a greater impact on uh, the response of detector B. And finally, and this is the most, at, at least to me, the most interesting, that this issue of periodicity in pi persists. Any of these figures, the ones on the right, had I run them at, at uh, after, so the same switching time plus the pi, I would get the same exact behavior, right? Even if we introduce squeezing, which kind of introduces a direction in the disturbance of the field, um, we see um, we see this, again, this running back in time behavior. So apologies for, for going late. Just the quick uh, recap of what we discussed. We, we've shown how to generalize delta switching to a spherical space time. We've looked at what one and two detectors can tell us about the band limit, and we've used unreduit detectors as sort of, and delta switching as a local proxy of the field and have observed uh, certain features about the, the field dynamics this way. And thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ahmed. Good talk. All right, we move to the questions now.
please use the raise hand feature as usual. I don't see any hands. Uh, maybe I can ask a quick question. Um, so you, you cut, so when you introduce, you said that you were going to use the band limit, you're cutting off the L sum. That's what you're doing, but nothing yes. else? Only um, the L sum? Only the L sum, yes. Uh, so, so you kind of like, in this case, you're blurring the angular resolution of things, of the perception of the detector in a way. Exactly. But not the energy exactly. resolution. Oops. Exactly. No worries. Right, sorry, yes. somebody is drilling. That's the no. thing of being at home. Uh, some neighbor is really so the I was saying that so it's uh, in this case you're not cutting off there's no UV scale then right you're cutting in a way not in energy in a way you're cutting kind of the angular ah. and so okay so um, I think that's a great question and, and the way I like to think about this is uh, based on um, yeah exactly exactly because based on the 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 previous talk that Laura gave that the band limit it, when, when, when it comes to delta switching the band limit just modifies the shape of the detector mm -hmm. so we were using the the L max which actually should be infinitely many of them to reliably um, recreate the shape of the detector or the profile of the detector from the from the spherical harmonics modes from that decomposition so we're using that as a cutoff as well. Just a comment about it. maybe I'm confused about the notation. And I think that on this uh, three sphere that you're considering, L max is really, I mean, it's like having a cutoff in the modulus of the momentum, so to speak. Think of really, you know, when you go to the, the, the short distance limit where it's almost flat, you could see that there's a relation between this L, which is in, it corresponds to the inverse of the uh, cutoff in the angular size. So no, no, you're right. I was thinking if I were doing a spherical harmonic expansion in a flat space time of a field, of course. No, you're right. right. So yeah. this is this is certainly certainly a UV cutoff in a way. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you, Albert. That was that was helpful. Thank you. Albert. Thank you so much for the insight. Yeah. Uh, Ken has a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, could you go back to like a very early pages? Um, it's a little bit technical, but I want to ask, yeah. So here I have F, J, K, L, M. Mm -hmm. And like, um, do you, uh, did you calculate this thing? I mean, it, like I know Eduardo and the paper on coherent state and then harvesting did this. Uh, I just want to know, like, uh, do you usually do this calculation by hand or like uh, using Mathematica or Maple. Like I'm so, trying to do it, this one, but it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's hard by doing it by hand, so. So yeah, um, you're absolutely right. This is the, the same calculation basically from the, uh, the paper, but in particular, it's simpler because First of all, we're only particular, or like we particularized it only to the vacuum, not any arbitrary coherent states of the field. Uh -huh. um, second of all, yeah, these calculations are a little bit tedious, so you can easily do them in Mathematica. Um, okay, so and Mathematica. Yeah, and and to be honest, to be fair, I have skipped a lot of intermediate details in okay. between. I'm just yeah. kind of stating things as is. Uh -huh. um, I can send you. Um, those calculations. Oh, okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. yeah. So for, for an arbitrary, so this is, so the calculations may be uh, very tedious and long and needs a lot of bookkeeping, but they're very, there's nothing really difficult in principle about them. Um, I would say in, in terms of, I mean, again, <laughs> easy for me to say, right? Because uh, the way we did in the paper, Peter was a master student that did the calculations uh, and uh, using both mathematical checking but also analytics. It's just a lot of bookkeeping, right? There's no, no okay. special tricks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions, anybody? Okay. The, the one thing maybe I would say, otherwise, the one thing if you're doing calculations like did with, with this with delta switching, the trick, if you want, I mean, I said there's no special tricks, but of course. 
no special tricks if you work with uh, Android detectors and delta switching. The, the reason why the delta switching uh, makes the calculations easy non-perturbatively is because uh, in the end, you get an exponential that's no longer time ordered and uh, you have a, a qubit operator uh, and that thing squares to uh, identity and itself. So it's very easy to sum the series of the exponential completely. It's very easy to, um, to separate the detector part from the field part. And it becomes a displacement operator acting on the field. And then a uh, uh, detector operator is a qubit operator. So it's very easy to work with it. But of course, you need to do it once. But I would say that in the paper, all these steps are, are done, uh, Ken, if you're looking for something like, uh, like this. Most of there's some appendix where these steps are done more or less with all, with all details. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Any more questions, anybody? So, so just one, one more, perhaps. So what was the motivation to study uh, this scenario in particular? Is there anything uh, um, uh, in particular you're look, going after by looking at this particular space time? And, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I think um, the idea is we were hoping once we um, once this work is finished, the future work would try to extend this to ADS, yeah. and in particular the R cross S two um, ADS is conformal to that. So it'd be very interesting to see how we can kind of just conformally map the results and what would stay the same and what would change, and, I see. and so on. Yeah. All right. And if, Sorry, I, I, if I can add something to that, please, yes, please. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, another motivation is there's this like this notion of sort of concerns of QFT on a on a compact surface. So by looking mm. at, at two detectors and doing it non-perturbatively, we can hopefully get a better idea of do things go wrong and if so, how? And it turns out that they don't, or at least they don't appear to. All right. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Well, Laura, can you can you can you explain? Explain, elaborate on these concerns about quantum field theory on uh, compact uh, hyp spatial hypersurfaces. What, what are those concerns? Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think I can quite um, elaborate on what those specific concerns are at this point. Um, I just, so perhaps someone else can. I'm just aware that there are concerns. For example, if this, I mean, just looking at, at say these slides, the signal from A comes around and it gets all it gets concentrated at the pole. You know, is it gonna what's gonna happen? Yes, those things do happen. Yes. Uh, okay, so that 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 kind of concerns. But yeah. Okay, but still, I think that the quantum field theory is well defined as a. I mean, it has some peculiarities that might have some peculiarities like this refocusing and things like that. That's true. Yes. But okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and that and that is what we 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 observe in particular. Why we still don't don't fully understand what happens at the pole, right? We we don't run into any divergences or anything like that. The theory is still well behaved. It's just peculiar, as you said. Right. Exactly. Yes. We we actually looked at that quite some time ago in the context of ADS, and yes, you you find things like that indeed. Yes. Do you have a reference for that? Oh uh, yes, please. Yeah. No because we never published, unfortunately. No All right, thank you. But, uh, but yes, it's what you find that you have peculiarities at the, at the opposite uh, pole, but not, not, not divergences. So yes, it's really compatible. When you were presenting your results here, it, it reminded a lot of the kind of things that we also saw, yes. All so right. it's, that's in general something that you have, but it's not really, it's a peculiarity. It's not, I don't think it's really a, you know, serious pathology. Good to know. Yeah, thank you so much for the insight. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any more questions, anybody? All right, if there aren't any more questions, oh, I hear something, but probably not a question. If there are any more questions, then let's thank again, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thank you and that's all, all the speakers of the session today, great talks, thank you very much. Before we finish today, uh, just a reminder that uh, we will be here next week at the same time. And I hope to see you all um, again, now that we are all coordinated, it's 9 a.m. EST. And again, I'll see you for the 11th session. Take care for the rest of the week. Bye-bye.